So, here we are then. Obviously this game's been requested quite a lot. That does tend to happen after you do a 7 part series entirely on the game that preceded it. People have wanted me to do Final Fantasy VIII ever since. And so finally, here we go. I've decided to give it to you. Now I should immediately say this off the bat, don't expect the same sort of thing as FF7. Final Fantasy VII is a game that I've played through multiple times for about 20 years. It's my favourite game of all time. There's not a lot I don't know about it, to be honest. Final Fantasy VIII, on the other hand, is a game that I only ever played up to, I guess, about halfway through disc one. I stopped because my copy of the game got stolen, and until now, I've not touched it since. This is going to be more of a learning experience, then. What you're seeing here is the first time I've played this game for nearly 20 years, finishing what I've started. Still, hopefully it should have some worth. And that's not to say we won't be going into any detail at all. FF8 has always had an interesting place in the Final Fantasy canon. I don't think there's any other game in the franchise that's more decisive than this one. It slowly seemed to gather more fans over time and people willing to write in praise of the game, but it is still definitely considered one of the lesser entries in the series. Around the start of the internet reviewing craze, its reputation was pretty frickin' low. One guy in particular, Spoonie, back in his glory days, got a big part of his following through taking the game and bodying basically everything about it. Two hours and forty minutes of ripping the fin apart. Fins are a little better for the game now, but only just. It just seems lesser compared to the games between it, the hulking behemoth that is Seven, and the much loved Back to the Roots Nine. Is this surprising? I'm not sure. Final Fantasy VIII's position was always going to be difficult because the series had changed so much. It started as Square's last shot, indeed their final game, which is what it would have been if the first Final Fantasy hadn't been a big hit in Japan, even getting an American release. But for five main games afterwards, the series largely stayed in Japan. Two of the games came out in America and were loved by the audience, but it was a kind of niche one. Over here, we didn't even see Final Fantasy at all until Seven, which changed everything. That was the series' introduction to the world, really. The 10 plus million copies it sold speak for themselves, immediately proclaimed as one of gaming's greatest achievements. JRPGs went from something that half the time didn't leave their home country, to the brand new hotness. In terms of sales, it's still the most popular entry in the series, and honestly, I doubt that's going to change. Its sequel then was put in an unenviable position, one that I don't think any other game in the series has been at before or since. Simply put, I can think of very few games where the expectations were so high in anticipation of the game's release. Metal Gear Solid 2, Grand Theft Auto 4, Half-Life 2 perhaps, not many more. In these cases, it's impossible to see how they could have gotten any higher. The previous game wasn't just a classic, it was a sales monster. In one way, it's good for the expectations to be so high. It certainly guarantees good sales, and that happened. Hell, it sold over 8.5 million, and until FF13 it was the fastest selling entry in the series. Really, that only changed because FF13 went multi-platform. However, it can be a bit troublesome for a series that is known for changing things up so much. Every Final Fantasy is set in its own universe, the storylines are often totally different, the way the games play vary a hell of a lot. Less thematic similarities, sure, but don't expect everything you loved about the previous game in the series to be in the next one. If you're a veteran of the series, you'll know this, but a lot of us only had seven at the time. Which is why I think a fair few of us, having experienced the world crisis in the last instalment, might have been disappointed by the much smaller stories centering largely around two people, neither of whom are exactly regarded amongst the most endearing protagonists, not in the way that classic Cloud was. He and FF7's main guy, the gunblade toting Squall Leonhardt, may both swing big swords, but they are kind of different. Nor is there really a Sephiroth equivalent, or even an Iris equivalent. Don't discount the importance of that. FF8's story isn't based on such shocking twists. We know a heartily Squall's main squeeze is kind of a Tifa equivalent in the way that Squall is sort of a Cloud equivalent, but both will suffer in a direct comparison. Nor is this game all that dystopian either. It's got the sci-fi stuff, but it's different, more subtle. The game's box is a clue to the differences. In the old days, there always used to be a drawing with the game's name that hinted at the content within. FF7 features the meteor, the thing that in-game is going to end the world. FF8 features Squall and Rinoa in an embrace, the first sign before you even load the game that this is going to be a different experience. So in respect of that, I'm not going to try and compare FF8 to FF7 that much unless there's clear similarities that are meant to hook you in, as that may well lead to its downfall. 
In respect of what the series tries to do with each instalment, I'm going to play the game on its own merits, as I think that's best. Later on, Square would certainly try to attract people into new games more with clear markers towards the past. Here, I think they were largely doing what they'd always done. Work on FF8 started while FF7 was still being localised into English, after all. Also, we're playing the PC version, which isn't ideal, but my new PS1 copy turned out to be crap, which was nice. It's not a bad port nowadays, mind. The graphics are alright, and there's the Roses and Wine mod which brings the PlayStation music into the game and frankly, should be considered essential if you're going to play FF8 on PC through Steam. Unless that is, you would prefer the game's soundtrack to be rendered in Windows 98-tastic basic MIDI sound fonts. Anyway, let's get on to the game itself. It all starts with a big old opening video, a beach and the soothing sounds of Liberi Fatali. We see pretty much all four of the main people. There's Squall and Rinoa in the field, there's Adir, a sorceress who unsurprisingly is the game's main antagonist, but the main thing people remember is the big fight between Squall and his rival, Cypher Almazi, both toting their respective gun blades. This weapon being a particular source of hype, now this is definitely a link between FF8 and FF7. The first game established that massive swords were a good thing, and FF8 ups the ante with another massive sword, only this time there's a gun attached to it. Oh, holy shit! I imagine that the simple word gunblade was enough to guarantee many a purchase. It should be noted, mind you, that the gunblade is actually not a sword that fires bullets. It is in fact a gun with a trigger on it that when pressed, sends vibrations through the sword as if a bullet had been fired through it. Cut someone with this when it's vibrating and presumably that's going to cause a lot more damage and go through easier. So basically, it's a vibro sword. I know, I was surprised to learn this too. Naturally, some people have either attempted to recreate the weapon in real life, or given their thoughts on how feasible said weapon is, and most agree that even theoretically it's completely ridiculous. I mean, would you want to swing something that big around with a freaking crooked gun handle? But this is a JRPG, and such logic has no place here. Anyway, it turns out that the epic battle between Cypher and Squall where the former tried to carve our hero's bloody head off was just training, although Squall will be left with a big old scar on his face. Both are part of the Balaam Garden Academy and are training to be super elite soldiers, or SEED as the game calls them. A private army basically, ready for action at any time. And so here's another similarity between FF8 and FF7. Like the previous game, you'll be spending a lot of your time in the opening in one big old area. Unlike Midgar though, Balem Garden is more like a base of operations. The world map, or at least the first continent, is open to you from the off, but you'll be coming back here quite a bit in the opening. Largely the first part of the game deals with Squall's training, and the first characters you come across, himself, Cypher, Quistis, their tutor, and Zell, who's another student. Generally, things move at a slower pace in FF8 than they did in FF7, that's clear from the off. Of course, FF7 isn't out there. Few RPGs start with you going straight on a bombing mission where you blow up a freaking reactor, while FF8 does set up fins more traditionally. Still, you should generally get used to less fins happening. <laughs> as far as the characters go? Well, Squall is a man of few words. His main quote is usually an ellipsis and a whatever. He completely lacks social skills. As such, people generally don't like him, as in real people. His introduction is totally different to Cloud's total arrogance and bravado. He's more intriguing, usually dismissed as a typical whining bloody emo. But is there something more there? There are some strange touches early on. Quistis, his instructor, who in typical JRPG style is a prodigy and thus still a teenager herself, openly flirts with him most of the time, and Squall doesn't rebuff it as much as he just doesn't get it. The hints, which are not subtle, just pass him by. He usually says more in his inner monologue than he does to other people. A oddly passive character then, especially for a main hero. Some fan theories, and yes this should really not be taken as canon, have posited the idea that Squall has Asperger's Syndrome or is in some way autistic, although there's no evidence whatsoever for anything like that. Unsurprisingly, he doesn't get along well with Cypher, who is more of your typical Cloud-style ace, arrogant as hell, good and he knows it. Weirdly also the head of the Garden's Disciplinary Committee, even if he has no issue with trying to take another student's head off in training. Cypher is one of the fun bits of characterisation in FF8 as he does turn the Cloud characterisation on its head somewhat, showing how easy it is for a hero to be an arsehole instead. 
although obviously Cypher does lack Cloud's deep-rooted identity issues. The name could also be seen as an allusion to Sephiroth, although I think in many ways he's closer to FF7's protagonist than he is to its antagonist. Anywho, things are pretty free and easy from the first little bit of tutorial, the Fire Cavern, until you get to the first seed exam. You're supposed to take your time and figure out the gameplay, and this is where you come across the real big differences and the rather odd things about the game's battle, magic and character building systems. The big differences? Well, Materia is gone. In FF8, magic has been turned into some science called power magic, and it can be drawn out of enemies as standard. No little orbs of energy required. As such, magic acts like an item. You have a supply of spells, but when you use them all, they're gone until you get more. Basic spells such as Fire, Blizzard and Cure can be found all over the shop, but more advanced spells such as, say, Thundaga or Blizzarga, or Bolt Free and Ice Free if you're used to FF7's less traditional namings, are much harder to come by. If you get them, then you shouldn't use them willy-nilly. And so magic does not level up the way it did in FF7. There is no such thing as MP in FF8. You can cast as many instances of a spell as you want in a battle, and the only thing that limits you is how much of that spell you have. What levels up instead are your summons, or what this game calls Guardian Forces, or GFs. After the first dungeon, you'll already have three of them. When you summon a GF in battle, a second ATB timer starts, during which time the GF takes damage instead of you, and once that timer ends, a summon attack happens as normal. Like magic, as long as the GF's HP isn't zero and they aren't knocked out, you can use them as much as you want in a battle. Outside of battles, the GF's health automatically regenerates as you move. Simple enough, but that's not even half of what GFs do. GFs level up, and can be set to learn many abilities, from new commands that you can use in battle, to stat increases to, most importantly of all, the refinement ability, which we'll get into shortly. This all blends into the game's big mechanic, junctioning. You can junction GF abilities and magic to your stats, which is the real way that you create a strong character. FF8 still has traditional levelling up a la FF7, but it's very different here. In FF8, most of the game's enemies and bosses level up with you, and so traditional grinding for levels can make something of a wad for your own back. You do need to level up in order to better access the really strong magics, items and so on, but because of this, enemies will be very strong at the higher levels. Correct usage of junctioning is how you always stay ahead of them. So yeah, that is basically FF8's system. It is kind of varied and tough to get used to which I do think in many ways contributed to a few complaints about FF8's gameplay. You see, in FF8 there is this command called Draw that you use to take magic spells away from monsters during battle and add them to your supply. In the opening tutorials, the game kind of conditions you into thinking that drawing is going to be really important and the main way that you get magic in the game. This can go several ways, one way in particular being that you could think, well shit, I don't want to run out of spells. And the more of a spell I have, the stronger a stat is when I junction the spell to it. So I best get out in the field and draw a hundred cures, a hundred fires, a hundred scans, a hundred blizzards. Needless to say, drawing spells all the time in battle soon gets very tedious. You get a random number between 0 and 9 each time, and it makes everything feel like a grind. This, however, is one. What you actually need to focus on is levelling up those GFs, and in particular getting them to learn their refinements. Refinements allow the GFs to draw magic from regular items, and this is how you really increase your supply of magic. For basic spells like Cure and Blizzard, you refine Emstone pieces, which are everywhere, into your magic supplies using the appropriate GF, getting a fixed amount every time. You should use drawing just to top up, either on the odd occasion in battle, or from the many draw points dotted around the world. You can also use draw to get the odd GF sometimes. You should never spend ages grinding out 100 spells using draw. Not only is it unfun, it's thoroughly inefficient. And drawing just to cast a spell? Totally pointless. Drawing is nothing compared to refining. That's the mechanics, anyway. How does this work in practice? Well, in short, Guardian Forces totally break the game. In fact, they're just one of the many ways in which this game can be broken. We'll get to others, believe me. If you know what you're doing and research just a little, as I did, you can break the game immediately. Here's the first big example. A little beach just outside Balaam Garden, where you can fight these little fishies, the Fastita Colon F as they're known. They're kinda strong and just attacking them isn't recommended, but Guardian Forces? They'll handle them no problem, 
Two summons and they're basically dead, especially if you're using Kezakotal as they're weak to lightning. If the GFs get a bit weary, well, just move away from the beach for a bit. One battle nets you 6 ability points, which is how the GFs level, and 6 AP is a lot, especially now. Doing this, you can easily learn the refinements for your free current GFs, as well as the all-important card command, which we'll get to. It won't even take an hour. And that's not all. These little fish drop fish fins, one of which can be refined into 20 water spells. Water is an incredibly powerful spell for the start of your game, and junctioning it to Squall's attack really boosts his damage. This should condition you into something else. Are you better off using any of those 100 water spells, or just using them as a junction? Well, they're much better as a junction. You're going to be doing much more damage on the whole with your basic attack than with a water spell. Indeed, using the spells will decrease the power of your attack. Magic is obviously essential in the junctioning system, but as something you use in combat, mm, not so much. So how does all of this feel? Well, the thing about ff 8 system is that there's two extremes to it depending on how you play. Grindy and tedious, and utterly broken. There's not really a middle ground. A little work at the start and you're basically going to be good for a long time. Hell, you pretty much have to work to not break the game at some points. If you like to break JRPGs over your knee, and I kind of do, well, you've sure come to the right place. If you would actually like something of a challenge, you're going to have to purposefully control yourself a little, but you should at least do some of these things so you don't have to always be bloody drawn. Breaking the game is kind of easy, though. I sort of miss how you really had to earn those breaks back in FF7, like when you figured out how to beat the Midgar Zolem the first time you encountered him, and learned beta a whole disc before you were supposed to. I've only scratched the surface of just how much the game can be broken so early on. As we get into Triple Triad, you'll see how the game can be broken even more. We'll go back to actual story for now, but for the time being, let's just say that FF8 is very, very easy. FF7 was easy too, but FF8 makes it look like a wizardry game by comparison. So, the seed exam. First though, we get introduced to Zeldinkt. Picture a JRPG character modelled after, I don't know, Mike Durnt from Green Day, with a face tattoo. That's Zell. He's annoying, I don't like him, that's about it. In terms of typical FF characters, he's the hothead. Lots of flash, quick to get angry, not even half as fun in the role as Barrett is. Squall is, as usual, a man of few words. And then there's Cypher, who's going to be our captain on the mission. As ever, he's arrogant and looking for fun. One thing I like though about the dialogue is the subtle hints that this is not Cypher's first field exam. In fact, it's far from it. You only need to do the exam once to become a member of Seed. So for all his arrogance and his presentation as the best, Cypher's never actually passed this exam. Ergo, every other time he's been on it, he flunked it. It's a cool foreshadowing. Oh, and we also meet Balaam Garden's headmaster. His name is Sid. Sid Kramer, in fact. Now, in case you don't know, almost every Final Fantasy game has one character called Sid, the most famous obviously being ass-kicking, Venus gospel murdering, drink your goddamn tea, chain-smoking, swear hero Sid Highwind from FF7. The main series to date has featured two playable character Sids, 11 NPC Sids, and one antagonist Sid. The only game to not feature a Sid is the original NES title, although remakes have retconned Sid into that too. Hironobu Sakaguchi has said that there is no special meaning or direct reference behind Sid, but that he's generally supposed to be a wise character in the games. Sakaguchi compares him to Yoda. Anyway, we're off to the dukedom, whatever, of Dolit, because troops from Galbadia have invaded. We'll explain more about these places as we go, but Dolit kinda has the feel of an old mainland European town, which perhaps explains the dukedom bit. Not much of a mission, to be honest. Beat up a bunch of grunts, mainly. After doing this for a bit, Cypher gets pissed off with being told to wait around, and goes off towards a tower that the Galbadians are running to, thus breaking the mission orders entirely. I think we can see why this isn't Cypher's first rodeo. He's a loose cannon mechanical! At the top of the tower, we run into two other series mainstays, Biggs and Wedge. These two appear in most FF games as somewhat incompetent comic relief, and are a direct reference to Luke Skywalker's Rinmen in Star Wars when he blows up the Death Star. Much like Biggs in Star Wars, they often end up dead. In this instance, Biggs successfully gets this abandoned communication tower going before we slam the hell out of both of them in the boss battle. They then also get slammed by the real boss, Elvore, who we draw our fourth GF, Siren, from before slamming that too. 
One little similarity I dig is that much like Biggs and Wedge in FF7, their FF8 namesakes also come a cropper on top of a big tower. Mind you, we will be seeing them again. Oh, and I almost forgot. We've been introduced to another playable character. Selfie Tilmit is young and clumsy. You first meet her right in the beginning of the game when you can show her around Balaam Garden, but she gets her proper introduction here through falling off a little cliff. She's okay, somewhat comparable to Yuffie. Also I've noticed that Selfie's weapons of choice are nunchakus, that's very clear. In the original PAL version of the game, this was changed to something called a shinobu. Why? Well, nunchucks are classed as a prohibited weapon or banned outright in several European countries, but the reason they were often edited out of TV shows, films or games in the UK is all down to this one guy, James Furman, former secretary of the BBFC. He once read an article in Time Out magazine about the wide availability of things like nunchucks and flying stars, or shuriken, and from then on references to illegal weapons in media became something of a pet hate of his. I mean, unless they were guns, obviously. And so almost any sequence in a film or TV show involving nunchucks and the like was removed from anything classified in the UK. Cuts to martial arts films like Enter the Dragon, Michelangelo, Panther of Thundercats, Lelon having a three-pointed staff instead of his nunchucks in Soul Blade, they all suffered thanks to him. James Furman retired in 1999 and the rules on nunchucks relaxed immediately. The version of the game that I'm playing on Steam calls selfies nunchucks exactly what they are, and I presume that was the case when this PC port was originally released in 2000. Anyway, as I often do, I digress. We now have 30 minutes to get back to the dropship, but on the way we're thwarted by this huge robot called XATM092. The way this is supposed to work is that you beat him just enough to stop him, and then you try to evade him the rest of the way. However, as mentioned, Squall is a beast, and is even more of one now. And so on the third time of asking, I just blew the guy up. I'll explain more when we get back to gameplay. Eventually we make it back with loads of time to spare, and get back to Balaam for the results. And it's not good news for Cypher. As a result of disobeying a direct order, not only will he not be joining Seed, he's going to be disciplined. But Squall, Zell, and Selfie have all made the grade, and are now officially part of Balaam Garden's mercenary group. <laughs> Hooray for them. We get to the graduation party, where Squall contents himself with booze and blowing off Zell, which makes me like him, until finally a girl cajoles him into a thoroughly awkward pas de deux on the dance floor. In case you haven't gotten it yet, Squall is not good around people. Outside he has a somehow even more awkward conversation with Christus. One thing you might not be getting is all the long pauses between the text boxes, just to emphasise how stilted everything's supposed to be. It's like a bloody Harold Pinter play, and I dig that a lot. And my goodness, it gets worse when Christus invites Squall to the secret area inside the training centre. Now we know that Christus likes Squall a lot, not only as a student but as a person too. Things haven't gone well for her either, she's no longer an instructor and is now just a regular member of SEAT. It's not spelt out but it's implied that she failed as an instructor due to being unable to control her group, as in what Cypher did. Christus pours her heart out to Squall who… utterly blows her off, acts like a total shithead, says all the things you shouldn't say. Again, what's not spelt out is that a part of Squall does want to be open to Christus's problems, but something else is clearly rejecting it, there's a barrier stopping him from getting close to people. Lots of people don't like Squall, and after this scene I got that. This is still the getting to know phase, and first impressions of Squall are purposefully not good. He's not presented as cool, that's kind of Cypher's job. In fact, he's actively dislikable, and in keeping with the character, that's the side we're seeing of him right now. He's not exactly people's favourite FF protagonist, and this is a big reason why, but I don't think you're supposed to like Squall right now, which is kind of interesting. Perhaps things will change, Christus hasn't quite lost hope. The girl who Squall saw when he was resting up also makes an appearance, and we save her from another monster who gets the overkill treatment. For now though, her and the girl we danced with are still basically a mystery. And so finally Squall gets to have a rest. Good thing too, because the first seed mission starts tomorrow. For now though, you might have noticed just how ridiculous the damage I'm doing with Squall is at the moment, and obviously that does warrant an explanation. It's time to go back to breaking the game.
Back when I was getting refinements for my GFs, I also learnt two other abilities, Card and Card Mod. Card is a very useful command. It allows you to turn most enemies into a card once they've taken enough damage. Not only does this give you a card, but it's also a way to end a battle without earning XP for your characters, but you still win items and AP for your GFs. This is very handy as it prevents over leveling. And what do we use these cards for? Why we play Triple Triad! After FF7 most people agreed that having minigames was a good thing, but rather than have a load of different ones or a place like Gold Saucer to do them in, FF8 has Triple Triad, a card game with lots of different rules that you can play with quite a lot of the game's NPCs. Simply hit square and if they play, you can challenge them. The game works as follows. You select 6 cards to play with from your deck. In the top left corner there's 4 numbers, these are the cards values on each side. Say my opponent plays this card, you see that the value on the right is pretty low? Well if I play this card next to it on that side, then I've won that card. Whoever's won the most cards once the 3x3 grid is filled wins the game and they get to take cards out of their hand. They could take one card, they could take a random one, or they could take the whole hand depending on how the game's being played. Triple Triad is a pretty freaking cool minigame, something that you can constantly get into, if even just to chill for a bit. But of course it can be used to smash the game to a ridiculous degree. At the start of the game you get a few crap cards from this guy, assuming you talk to him. Traditionally from here you should play games, lose some, win some, gradually build a better deck, but sod that, we can go around a little, say back to the fire cavern, and get some better ones by using the card command against bombs. Doing this a few times should give us something we can work with. And then, well yeah, just play. Go around to the Balaam Garden and play a lot. Specifically though, you want to play against this guy, or this guy, or this guy. Get the rare cards, get 5 abyss worms ideally, 15 if you're really going for a full beast party, although that can take a while. Once you've built an okay deck though, 5 abyss worms takes about an hour of triple triad, which isn't a lot in the world of grinding. What can you do with 5 abyss worms? Well the card mod ability that we also learned works like a refinement, only with cards. Now they can be changed into items too. One abyss worm card refines into one windmill, one windmill then refines into 20 tornadoes. Tornado at this stage of the game is ludicrous. Junction 100 of lows onto Squall's strength? You're basically good until disc 3. You're a juggernaut. It's even worse due to how Squall works in battle and how limits work. You see, Squall is special. When you attack, if you press R1 right when he's about to strike, you will always do a critical hit. They aren't as powerful as other characters' luck-based criticals, but still, if you learn the timing, it's a critical every time. Also, his hit ratio is 255%, meaning that he never misses an attack, ever. This stat has logical reasons to be so high, as it's due to Squall's proficiency with his Gunblade. Fellow Gunblade wielder Cypher shares this outrageous stat. And then there's Limits. Back in FF7, Limit Bars gradually raised as you took damage. Here, if you have low HP and the Crisis level, as it's called, is high, then the Limit option will pretty much always be open. Squall always does a multi-hit limit break, Lorenza Kuken, where R1 button presses also apply, and occasionally does a finishing move to go along with it. At this stage of the game and for a long time after, well this is vicious against almost anything, it's about 5000 HP worth of damage. Only this T-Rex or can stand up to that. And if you're worried about keeping Squall on such low HP, well don't, because during the first seed exam I got my fourth GF, Siren. After doing the usual learning of refinements with her, I was able to take 30 tents and refine them into 300 Kuragas. This is what 100 Kuragas does when junctioned to Squall's HP. You see? You can keep Squall at around 6 to 700 HP, more than enough right now, and he'll be able to murder basically anything at a moment's notice for a long time. This game. Holy hell is it broken. What was all that about Squall being a whiny emo again? This guy will fuck your ass up harder than the Wu-Tang Clan. And still, I'm only scratching the surface. With cards and refinements, there are so many ways of going about this. That became clear as I was researching the game. You could go further. Like, you could craft most of your party's ultimate weapons by the end of disc 1. That's not a joke. With that in place, Squall can do high 5-figure damage by the end of the first disc. Quiz Disc can learn a limit spell that outright kills most enemies in the game instantly. In fact, I did that one because I had most of the cards I needed to mod for the items you need just through playing. 
Hell, if you don't want to bother with grinding Abyss Worm cards for Tornado, you could always win Quistus' card from one of her groupies, then you can mod that into free Samantha Souls and refine Lowe's into triples, which have basically the same effect. If you're worried about losing rare cards, don't, because you will get the opportunity to get them back later on. There are so many possibilities, and I couldn't possibly go through them all. A lot of people who love FF8 do so for these reasons. All of this is open to you right from the off. There's no mundane grinding for levels, the fun stuff like Triple Triad if you enjoy it is there immediately, and you can get straight on with breaking the game and creating a beast. And I do actually dig that. I like breaking RPGs, I like overkills, I like going back to early game trash mobs and using Knights of the Round on them, and so I like the way FF8 plays. FF8's system is actually quite remarkable to me, allowing so much variation and cute little ways to smash the game that, in the grand scheme of things, don't require a ludicrous hundreds of hours commitment to do, and you can do it right from the beginning. As it is, I'm going to chill on game breaking for now, as much as I dig it. We are going to be good for a long time, meaning that we can fully concentrate on story. And so, we are now Seed. Based on our performance in the exam, we now have a seed rank too. This can vary wildly depending on how you did. If you talked to other people too much or evaded too many battles, you get points knocked off. Being seed also means you start earning money, you no longer earn gil in battles. Instead you're paid a wage as a seed member. Being a part of seed is another reason to not shy away from fights. Your level gradually goes down and it's only maintained through fighting monsters. Don't fight them and you lose rank, which loses you money. There are other ways you can lose rank by not maintaining the standards expected of a member. So far, I really like how gameplay and story intertwine in FFA. There is a solid logical base for just about everything so far. Considering how radically different FFA is to most every RPG that came before it, I get the sense that the team really wanted the world to be consistent without just casually explaining away the usual RPG cliches. And it works, because Finns are a lot more grounded here. I mean, Seed is a weird Finn. Even if dystopia isn't as obvious here as it is in FF7, it says a lot about FF8's world when there are these military schools who have their own mercenary groups, trained from a young age, that get sent off to help the highest bidder for their services. We aren't loyal to Balaam or anything like that, we're loyal to money. They routinely send these teenagers off to pass exams in real life combat situations, they keep monsters in the training centre who will kill you. Something's not spoken. What about all the people who don't make it? Where's all the bodies at? In Final Fantasy VII, Cloud started off as a grunt, but that was before the game got started. When you started, you had a cause, a moral imperative. In FF8, you don't even have that. In Final Fantasy VIII, being a grunt is your first aspiration. And now you're part of Seed, meaning that you are a grunt. It's not actually that special when you think about it. So our first mission takes Squall and company to a place called Timber. On the way there, however, the party seemingly get a dose of knockout gas and have this weird dream where they're Galbadian soldiers. Squall suddenly takes the role of Laguna Loire, a hard-drinking bro-type soldier with his pals Kiros and Watts. He's somewhat more talkative, but no less awkward, as evidenced when he tries to approach a girl playing piano in a bar. Still, something about Laguna attracts this girl to him, and they end up in a hotel room together. Laguna is, well, he seems to be a bunch of things that Squall would like to be. He's more comfortable around people, he has that badass sort of image, and even though he is awkward, he can sure as hell talk a lot. He has less inhibitions. Still, Squall doesn't think that much of him, as evidenced by his classic line when he wakes up from the dream. I dreamt that I was a moron. Jeez, Squall's really got a touch for these cutting one-liners. Anywho, for this... Anywho, for this mission we're being paid by a resistance force in Timber, who are leading a charge against those damn Galbadians. We're getting the impression now that Galbadia is the driving force in this world. They're certainly the most militaristic one, what with their antics in Dolit and now this. They took Timber over a while back and apparently it wasn't pretty. The Resistance, meanwhile, is led by… that girl Squall danced with at the graduation. Turns out her name's Rinoa. Squall finally has a name to the face. They're both here now and this is after all their story. Another subtle FF8 touch, by the way, is that unlike most FF games, Squall and Rinoa are the only two characters you get the chance to rename. Everyone else, Zell, Selfie, Quistis and company, stay that way. 
So you know, you could give one of them your name and the other one someone who's close to you, if you're feeling very corny. You can also give names to your guardian forces, which emphasises somewhat that they are sort of your pets and they tend to prefer being used by one of you over everybody else. Anyway, the Resistance's plan... Anyway, the plan of the Resistance is to take their train and use it to kidnap Vinza Dalin, the president of Galbadia, by replacing his exclusive cart with a fake one. And so it's minigame time. You have to use codes to uncouple the cart without thwarting the guards below to your presence. A typical FF thing that does break the game up and stops it from just being go here and kill some monsters. Seed themselves are somewhat nonplussed about the whole thing as the Resistance appears to be sort of incompetent. Remember, Squall and company are mercenaries, they don't have beliefs, or they're not paid to have beliefs. The plan itself works out fine, but the Resistance didn't count on the Galbadians using a body double, who turns out to be this really creepy undead monster who's probably the hardest enemy you've faced so far. I should note that the first time I played the game, this battle stopped me dead, especially because I hadn't actually saved in hours. Everything from here on out is brand new to me. Of course, we don't have much trouble this time round, but I should have remembered that because the monster is undead, I could have just chucked a phoenix down in his direction. Phoenix downs resurrect people usually, but for undead monsters the reverse is true. They instantly kill them. It turns out that the President is on his way to Timber so that he can make a television broadcast. This is actually a big deal, as there hasn't been a broadcast via radio waves for 17 years. Everything in FF8's world is online. This was why Galbadi wanted to get that comms tower online back in Dolet. The Resistance crouched down and tried to think up a plan to thwart this in minutes, much to Seed's displeasure. They all think they're very unprofessional. And it gets worse. They see the contract that Sid wrote up for them, which gives the Resistance full control over the squad until Timber is independent. What the hell's going on? Thinking back, it seems that the Garden faculty weren't too pleased about the mission you were going on. And holy hell, if you didn't think that you were a grunt before, you sure are now. It doesn't help that the relationship between Squall and Renoa is awkward as hell. When you meet, it's clear that Renoa was actually expecting Cypher. The dance didn't go that well after all. She's surprised and somewhat disappointed to learn that Cypher, who she met afterwards and who was able to introduce her to Sid personally, is not actually a seed. Back in Timber, our plan is to bust the TV station and at least try to get some sort of message out. The G-Army's all over the place and the trains aren't running, but as we've seen, the army's not exactly a problem for Seed. The Resistance have a weird characterisation. They are somewhat capable, but when they aside, they do act as incompetent comic relief. It is a little confusing, but I guess that reflects Seed's opinion of them. Anyway, we find our way there. It does seem weird that we struggle to actually find the station when it's clearly the biggest thing in the town, but there you are. There is another weird touch. The radio signal hasn't been off as such, but seems to have been broadcast in all these weird messages for a long time. Like some monsters trapped in there. Anyway, the president's already there, and as the plan changes again, Renault and Squall finally have a right go at each other. Squall's pissed at the resistance's incompetence, Renault is annoyed at Seed's passivity. It's been building and this is literally their first mission together. We know I might come across as a bit spoiled here. Why is she mad at Seed when they've been brought here to help with this silly resistance? But her reaction is kind of understandable. Seed have been brought along to help, and they're not exactly helping much because Squall is so passive that he doesn't deign to make any suggestions as to the plan. Renoa is frustrated because these guys are clearly looking to her for orders, despite openly being at best ambivalent about anything she says, and also openly being a hell of a lot more trained and supposedly combat ready than she is. You'd probably be pissed off with Squall too in this situation. There's a whole bunch more to say here, but I'll keep it for now. As it is, the broadcast starting. First we get the signal going and... Holy shit! What are you doing here, Trump? How did FF8 call him as a president in 1999? I mean, just... what? Okay, I'm just plain. This guy's just the announcer, and any visual similarities to Trump are purely coincidental. But you do have to admit he looks a lot like him. This is the real guy, President Vinza Dealin. If anyone, he looks a bit like Bush Senior. He says that Galbadia is the only nation that can bring peace to the world. But there's a few matters that have to be solved with other nations first. Fortunately, he has an ambassador who'll be doing the rounds and sorting out these trifling affairs, which largely consist of, you're not under control of Galbadia, and 
we're going to make you be under control of Galbadia. Dealin just about manages to say that said ambassador is a sorceress before suddenly the broadcast is interrupted by Cypher. He's presumably bashed through everyone else to get here, and his gunblade is now at Dealin's throat. Christus is there too, trying unsuccessfully to control Cypher's savagery, and now we get to go there too. And when we get there, things get worse quickly. Everyone's shouting, Christus says that Cypher broke out of the disciplinary room, aka the brig, and Zell, being an idiot, manages to spurt out that they're all members of Seed and belong to Garden. Good going, dude. And then finally, the sorceress makes her appearance. She plays on Cypher's mental weak point by calling him a boy. If you consider the way that he's carried himself, you know that's the last thing Cypher wants to be. But seemingly, she assumes control, makes him let go of the prez, and takes him off through the wall. So, uh, yeah. Things have not gone well. In the aftermath, there's little to do except find our way out. At a friendly house, the team contemplate just how badly things have gone wrong. Selfie wants to go home, Zell knows just how badly he screwed up, Quistis has failed to control a student again, Rinoa, who actually has by far the friendliest disposition towards Cypher, is worried about him, and Squall is utterly oblivious, saying that he's most likely dead. Logically, seeing as he was captured in an attempt to most likely kill the president, this is true, but saying it kind of makes you totally suck as a leader. Rinoa hates this, argues with Squall again, and calls him a meanie. Yeah, a meanie. Look, we'll break all this down shortly. Finally, we're allowed to move on. Needless to say, Balaam Garden isn't somewhere we can go right now, as thanks to Zell it could potentially be directly in Galbadia's line of fire, so instead we opt to go to the nearest garden. Right here in Galbadia. This could be thought of as dangerous, but gardens are considered neutral zones in this world and thus one of them is probably the safest place to be right now. And so that's where we're going. Right, I think it's time for a summary of our characters and the general state of things. In short, everything and everyone is fucked. For some, the introduction of Winoa is where things start to go off the rails. If anything, she's less popular than Squall as a character. So far, I'm not quite feeling that, but we're still in disc one, so we'll see. But what's the impression that you have so far? Basically, everyone in this game is utterly useless and incompetent. That's the one I have. Our seed team are rubbish. They worked well in the controlled conditions of the field exam, but here? Well, they botched everything, people are dead, someone else got captured, they revealed where they were from and have potentially caused an international incident. Aside from that, it went great. And Squall? <laughs> well, he's not a leader. He has no idea what to say to people or how to direct them. His passivity caused a lot of this, just as much as Zell's hot-headedness caused him to say the one thing. Cypher is, if anything, even more of a hothead than Zell, and Christus couldn't do much to control that. Our headmaster Sid didn't even bother to explain what they were doing. To be honest, Selfie comes out of Finn's the best, if only because she's so laid back, but even so, it's not like she could change Finn's much either. What's stressed is that this whole thing isn't something you were basically powerless to stop, as is the case with similar situations in FF7. If Seed had done better, they could have stopped it. But they didn't, and it's their fault. And the Resistance? Well, as much as Seed clashed with them for being amateurs, because they're so much better, obviously, crouching down and trying to set plans in minutes and all that, at least they tried. Still, their main plan to capture the President was a duffer. It's purposefully very logical and thought through, but the point of it in writing, and how it works out, is that they can't see the forest for the trees, and because of that they were very easily fooled. It would have been better to concoct a riskier yet simpler plan, especially with seed in tow. Selfie's blow shit up with a rocket launcher suggestion may be kind of nuts, but something along those lines would have probably done the job. We're grunts, and we're good at doing grunt fins like leaving soldiers cold with gun blades, nunchakus and fists. As established, we are very bad at this thought-out, strategical-type nonsense. And then there's Rinoa. <laughs> Ooh boy. Again, not a popular character. If Squall is mopey and whiny, he's not so much that as utterly childish in his own way, Rinoa comes across as very immature and spoilt. Words like meanie don't help. God only knows what the writers were going for there. Surely jerk or even asshole would have been better. Hell, that one word is probably a big part of the reasons why people don't like Rinoa. It makes her sound 11 years old. She does serve a function right now though, 
she's the only person who stands up to Squall's coldness. As mentioned previously, Squall is a total asshole right now, and that's not changed. Funnily enough, her ability to actually think and act quickly, something that everyone else just lacks, may well have helped in the TV studio when chaos reigned, but she wasn't there. Why? Well, because of the argument that she had with Squall. The whole thing really is an omni shambles, isn't it? Good grief. From bean to cup, we fucked up. Before we leave Timberlow, I wish to point out a couple of things. First, for all of Squall's coldness, Selfie manages to get in quite possibly the, for lack of a better word, cuntiest line in the whole game right here when talking about the lady who is risking her house to hide you from Galbadian troops. I mean, holy shit! Talk about the unexpected savage! Why are we all such complete assholes? And Selfie's the good one! She's probably the only actually likeable character in the whole game at present, aside from the flashback people. I stress again that I believe this dislikability to be intentional, but damn. One other funny thing that happens is if you go into this old guy's house. Now you may have noticed another thing different about FF8. You don't really go into people's houses and root around for treasure chests. The game conditions you away from them. They aren't in dungeons, so they're not likely to be in towns either. There's a cupboard in this house that throws a lampshade on the whole thing. First time you try and open the cupboard, you're chided for it. The man wonders what young folks are doing these days, going around and opening cupboards. Two more times and you gradually get more hints, including one that points to something definitely being in there. On the fourth time you look closer, and all of a sudden, boom, you've found it. 500 gil. It's the family's savings and you've just taken them. My god, we are so heroic. So, so heroic. That said, I kind of wish that treasure chests hadn't been dropped if only because it gives you more impetus to check every house for them, and while you're there, you may as well hear the NPC stories, which often provide the character moments and details that you need to have a chance of grasping this game's plot. <sighs> so, far, <sighs> so far there's only three people who've shown all that much in the way of heroism or competence in the whole game, and they exist in a dream world. We kind of wish we was rolling with them right now. Don't fret though, after Inno and Squall get into their tenth fight of the day while walking through a forest on route to Galbadia Garden because Squall is once again being a complete asshole Mr Logic to Zell who's worried about Balaam, the hoodoo strikes again, causing Squall, Selfie and Quistis to feel asleep. And so we're back with Laguna, Kiros and good old Watts. This time they're on a mission in an excavation site for a lost civilization. A detail that, weirdly, you only find in menus. Like I said, you kinda need to look around a lot and talk to NPCs all the time. There's tons of world details and character details to find that gradually make the whole thing more sensical. If you don't, then you may end up feeling a bit lost. Laguna is kind of odd on this mission. He seems less sure of himself and prone to various mishaps, like dropping old keys out of his pocket, or obsessing over hatches, or getting more cramp in his legs. It's like he's going soft, and the interactions are very well written. Again, it's worth going around every nook and cranny because otherwise you might miss these little character interactions completely. And the other good thing about that is that you fight more enemies, which means you get to hear the man with the machine gun more, which is one of the best songs in the entire freaking game. Finally though, we get ambushed on the edge of a cliff. Even though we smash these guys, one of them gives Kiros and Watts a big critical hit before dying. Yay for narrative battles, I suppose? It is a little annoying. It kind of makes sense if you think of our squad as still part of the nondescript G army group that we routinely beat the piss out of, but then their stats are the same as ours, so it doesn't really come off that way. On the cliffside, Kiros and Watts appear to be close to death, but Laguna, who seems to have gone a little bit hat stand, sees a boat that will take them back to Galbadia. Heroically, he throws Kiros and Watts over the cliff's edge and into the water, before unheroically hesitating to go down himself, slipping, and bonking his head on the way down. And so the flashback ends with our daring Galbadian heroes in more than a little bit of peril. We're back in the room, and we're going to Galbadia Garden. Fortunately, it's right next to the forest. Galbadia's garden feels somewhat different to Balaam, although the makeup is similar, less populated perhaps, and also maybe a little hostile. Presumably word gets around about Seed's exploits in gardens across the world, and the fact that we royally screwed the pooch on our last mission is probably not going to endear us to the other folks in garden. One thing to note also is that Quistis and Selfie, like Kiros and Watts, are down to 1 HP and in desperate need of healing. That's important, 
It's a statement in gameplay that the dreams our group are having are closer to reality than they might appear. It's also a hint that while our parallel heroes might be down, they're not out. Christus, the only other person who's been here before, gets an audience with the Headmaster and relays the results back to us. Firstly, we're okay here, and secondly, Balaam Garden is okay. What happened in Timber is being treated as an independent action. In other words, Cypher has been thrown under the bus. More than that, the trial has already happened and the sentence has been carried out. So yeah, Cypher, as far as our group know, has been executed. Again, the dynamics are odd. All the Garden people in the room have little but negative memories of the guy. Zell hated him but is pretty shocked at his death, Selfie never really knew him, Christus thought he was troubled and has no good memories of him, and Squall is kinda complex but deep in his own thoughts about it. Winoa is the only one who has positive memories, including, as is revealed, a love affair last summer. There's also the unsaid thought. Did Cypher do that for Winoa? <sighs> Probably not. As evidenced by what Christus says, he was mainly doing it for him because he didn't trust these damn rookies to do the job properly. The body language here is fantastic, by the way, as it is through most of the game. A lot of folks worried about FF8's switch from the cartoony models we were used to to actual, properly proportioned people, but it definitely worked for the best here. Seriously, people's reactions make a lot of the scenes more than the text does. Squall is very troubled at how people are talking about Cypher. Suddenly he's in the past, he's a memory. This is not something that he's had to deal with, really. This whole scene where Squall kinda has an outburst is seen as another whiny emo me 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 moment for him, but really it's because Squall is so used to shying away from problems until they just go away, whether it's Christus pouring her heart out to him or Renoa calling out his coldness. Cypher being dead is not a problem that's going to go away, and Squall doesn't like it. Remember how immature and childish he actually is. The whole thing's another reminder of how stunted these folks are emotionally. Meanwhile, Squall runs into two people I've not touched on, Fujin and Waijin, who we've seen before. They're Cypher's lackeys and they're passing on a message from Balin. New orders. They also ask about Cypher, and Squall gives them the bad news. They don't believe it, mind you, and quickly announce that they're off to Galbadia to go look for Cypher. This could be seen as people processing grief in their own ways, but, well, let's review. Cypher is a highly capable soldier who clearly ripped through the entire President's guard to get a blade at his throat, this after breaking out of the Brigade Garden in the first place, and the last time we saw him was when he went through a wall into an unknown place under control of a sorceress whom we know little about. He is also a total hothead who will break skulls and scorch the frickin' earth at a moment's notice. Are we actually supposed to believe that Cypher, being who he is, would have submitted to an execution just like that? Like even if you're not bothering with due process or anything for a trial, and it's safe to say that Galbadia wouldn't bother, it's all a bit too fast and convenient, isn't it? Anyway, our new orders are communicated to us by Galbadia's headmaster, Martine. The introduction of this sorceress is very worrying indeed. It hardly needs to be said that Deelin's talk of bringing peace to the world was total bullshit, and that he actually wishes to bring the entire world to heal under Galbadia's wall. The sorceress is key to that, as she will intimidate the world's leaders into submission. You've already seen how effortlessly she got to Cypher after all. It should be noted that sorceresses have caused their fair share of problems in this world's past, and that Garden, despite being neutral, is not exempt from Lee's plans. And so Garden have taken the big step and given us the go-ahead to assassinate the sorceress. We will do so with the help of a sniper, who's going to be introduced to us right now. Meet Irvine, Irvine Kinnears. He apparently likes to get a rise out of people, he's a dick, and he decides to immediately make a party for himself with Selfie and Renoa a decision that I'm sure had nothing but strategy in mind. In this playthrough, Squall accepts Irvine's suggestion because he is, of course, an awful leader, and because the result is again more fun character moments. Christus' interaction with Squall here is probably one of the funniest moments in the whole game. For now though, well, we're off to Galbadia's capital, Deelin City. We've seen part of it in the Laguna flashbacks, but now we'll be seeing it for real. And yes, despite our tremendous failure in the last mission, we have now been entrusted with preventing the world from falling into Galbadia's hands. FF8's story gets a lot of shit, and I'm starting to get that more and more as we go. 
But for now, I do think that the story is more sensible and acceptable if you think of quite literally everyone as utterly incompetent for various reasons, and that it's exploring what makes these people so bad at their jobs and helping to make the world so terrible, whether it's immaturity, uncontrollable emotions, being corrupt or just, well, being an idiot. So on to Deelin. It's a beautiful and very busy place and there's a fair amount to see there. The design of the place is inspired by Paris, something that the big old gate should make obvious as it's based on the Lac de Triomphe. We have to meet up with a guy named General Carraway. Before we do though, a somewhat annoying guard tells us that we need to pass a test. This involves going to a place called the Tomb of the Unknown Kin and finding the idea of a lost, presumably dead student who went there. It serves as something to break up all the exposition and get a bit of gameplay in, but to be honest I want to see where the story goes, so I only do what's required of me. We'll go back there later. Anyway, we give the guy a code, and we meet up with the general. Seeing as he's clearly a high-ranking figure in the Galbadian government, it's intriguing to know why he's in on this coup. What does he gain? That's interesting to me. But instead we get another revelation. This is actually Renoa's house as well, meaning that General Carraway is Renoa's dad. Renoa ran off a while back to join with the resistance, and they don't like each other. There's not much further elucidation on this, however. I'm not a big fan of this revelation, to be honest. Maybe because I was hoping that Renoa had more of an interest in motivation for being a part of the resistance. And in the end, though, it all boils down to FUCK YOU, DAD! This is not something that stands in Renoa's favour as a character. Anyway, the plan is as follows. One team will act as a distraction, closing the gates on the sorcerer's float as she passes under the arc just as the clock strikes eight, at which point the sniper team will rise up on the top of a clock and have a clear shot at her. We also find out that the sorcerer's name is Adir, something that seems to strike a little memory bone in Squall. Again, I can't help but thinking that the plan is very overwrought. All these little details and so on. So many things that can go wrong. So many. Carraway running about the road and pretending he's the parade doesn't exactly help either. Again, my mind wanders back to Selfie, and her suggestion to just blow shit up. Is it really a good idea to basically tell a sorceress that you're about to try and kill her before you do it? Hey ho, we're Seed, and we're obviously not here to question our orders. Naturally, Irvine and Squall are going to make up the sniper team, and Quistis will lead Selfie and Zell in the Causeway team. But what of Winoa? Well, she's not Seed. Carraway says that Renoa should really not accompany the Seed on this mission, and while they're still taking orders from her, something that Squall reminds Carraway of in probably the most active moment we've seen from him so far, they're inclined to agree. As we're all moving out, Renoa comes in with her plan. She's got this magical necklace, you see. If the sorceress can be convinced to put it on, it'll nullify her powers. We'll do this by, um, doing it somehow. Christus has had enough of Winoa's shit and utterly roasts her before leaving her behind to wallow. So the first step is getting everyone into position. The Causeway team are positioned at the gates, while Squall and Irvine head to the parade and keep an eye on things for now. There's a pretty interesting dialogue sequence between them here, as Irvine muses on what they do and whether they should just kill anyone and never question orders. It's another foreshadowing, basically. Irvine is a dick and not a likeable character in the slightest, but it is an interesting moment, and Squall never really answers him, choosing to mull it over in his head. As a leader, he probably should have given him an answer. Still, everyone's in position. And then this happens. Quistis suddenly decides that she feels bad for bollocking Renoa just now. In fact, she feels so bad that, as leader of the team, she's going to go back to the house and apologise to her. Everyone says that we shouldn't leave their post, but, well, they follow her anyway. What do you think happens next? Back at the house, Carraway tries to explain to Renoa but gets blown off. He decides to try and lock her in by setting off a security system, a timed lock that emits a loud beep until it sets. Being that Renoa's obviously lived here too, she knows what that means, and so she escapes. Somehow, Quistis and company miss her as they're passing each other and they head straight into the room, just as the door locks, trapping them. And the sound of that door shutting is also the sound of me suddenly losing a ton of enthusiasm that I had for this game. Look, I get what the storyline is trying to do. I get that these people are supposed to basically be incompetent teenagers, and that because of this they screw up easily. But this? I mean, it's just too much. Obviously the game's been building up to it, but 
Holy hell, how stupid do you want to get? How much more do you need? I kind of got it already. Characters in games do do stupid things now and again, and yeah, they shouldn't be perfect. They should be human. But Jesus Christ! This is one of the stupidest sequences I have ever seen in a video game. And this is kind of the point where it stops being fun. There's a great danger when you make a game like this that you reach that point, and you would rather people just got their shit together. And this is it. The warning signs were there, the father revelation, the second overwrought plan. But I do feel that this may be the point where Final Fantasy VIII, as a story, kind of falls apart. Anyway, we're now in control of Winoa, who just has to climb some crates and stuff to get to the room that Adia's getting ready in. And what's her big plan? To approach Adia and say that she has a gift for her, hoping that she'll just put it on. Yet the stupidity doesn't stop. We already pretty much know that Adia can read people's minds, so needless to say Winoa doesn't get far. She's thrown back, knocked out, and possessed. Adia goes off to do her speech with a dazed Winoa and President Deelin by her side. Immediately she goes off script, chiding the crowd for cheering the Finn that they used to hate, sorceresses who were once responsible for the world's troubles. But all that's changed now, and Adir is going to rule the world. A concerned Deelin tries to get his ambassador back on track, and Adir's response is to give him the old T-1000 treatment. Dunked on. President Deelin ends up suffering the same fate as President Shinra. Thought he was going to be your main enemy? <laughs> nah, the actual one just killed him. A nice touch here is that all the while, the crowd cheers, even as Adir scolds them. There's a slight implication that Adir already has Lem under her spells too. In the crowd, Squall and Irvine can't help noticing that Winoa's swaying around by her side as Adir finishes her speech, calls for a sacrifice, and sets a couple of beasts after her. Irvine tries to get Squall to move now, but Squall knows that they will have a better chance when the parade starts in a minute. It seems to be another frustrating moment, but I do actually think that it's one of the first signs of a bit of character improvement for the guy. Winoa does need to be saved, but we need the opportunity. Squall is slowly becoming better at leadership. Back with the stupid idiots. They have to find a way out of this room, and do so by solving a simple puzzle. This opens a secret door that leads to the sewers. But enough of them, the parade's starting, and the sniper team finally has their chance. As they rush past the parade, we see that someone else is close to Adir's side. It's Cypher. As we suspected, he isn't dead at all. He's just under Adir's control, and loving it. No time to break this down now, Squall and Irvine take the same path that Renoa took. Obviously the thing to do is to take the hatch into the clock tower, but first there's the small matter of saving Renoa, who's now come around. The monsters in question get beaten easily, although annoyingly I miss the Guardian Force that you can draw from them. But now that Renoa's safe, we can carry on with our part of the mission. There's a bit more good dialogue. Squall explains to Renoa that Cypher is alive, but that he's with Adir, and says that at some point he may well have to kill him, but this isn't something he's actually happy about. It's also at this point where Squall and Renoa actually do start to warm up a little towards each other. Irvine, meanwhile, is kind of worrying about his job. We leave them just as he says to Squall that he can't do it. In the end, like all the rest of them, he may be good in training, he may be a crack shot when dealing with targets, but when it comes to killing people, he's just another bloody kid. The stupid idiots make their way through the sewers and finally get back to the gate, just in time. I haven't really stated, but this is an awful part of the game. Why this is in when all the action's going on, it just breaks things up completely, it's rubbish. As the clock strikes eight and Adir's float goes through the gates low, they do manage to close them. The clock tower rises up, and again, we have a good moment for Squall. Irvine still worries about taking the shot, the implication of what it means to kill someone who is now, for all intents and purposes, a head of state. And Squall, for a change, actually motivates him. He takes on the leader role, encouraging him and saying that he can do it, even if he misses. At last, Irvine lines up the shot, takes a breath, and fires. For all his worries, his aim is true. The bullets headed right for the space between Adir's eyes. However, this plan was shit from the beginning. Adir's obviously aware that something's going on, having gates shut on you will do that, and blocks the bullet. However, it distracts the crowd and gives Squall the opportunity to rush down there and get closer. First he confronts Cypher, who seems to relish his new role. He thinks of himself as a knight, an honourable person that is protecting his princess, Adir. This, again, is a consistent theme throughout the disc. Cypher is a distortion of a good guy. Taking the knight role is how he sees himself. 
whereas Squall is a mercenary, a role that usually has negative connotations. Despite all the stupidity happening, this is a good plot point and a role switch. As it is, the duel between Squall and Cypher doesn't last long. Two hits. We are still kind of overpowered. After that, the party faces a deer. If I'd drawn that GF, I'd have a more amusing way to beat her that involves breaking her AI, but while her high magic can smash the party a little, it doesn't do much to Squall. We do win eventually, or at least she stops the battle. She's not beaten, she just powers up some icicles and sends them flying in our direction. One of them goes right through Squall's chest and he collapses as Renoa watches in horror. End of FMV, end of the whole botched up plan to kill a sorceress, and at last, the end of disc one. Whew, my word that was a lot to get through. So, where are we at with the game right now? For the most part, I enjoyed playing Disc 1 a lot. There's a lot of fun stuff to do with the gameplay, and I really dig that side of the game. I dig a lot of the breaking of traditional RPG gameplay conventions that FF8 does, and I dig the lengths that it goes to reflect that in story as well as gameplay. I dig some of the neat twists and characterizations, and I think that it's a freaking beautiful game. Seriously, the cities, the models, all the little animations, they're wonderful. And I do get what they tried to do with the plot. But at the end of the disc, the whole stupid teenager's angle did become frustrating, and I fear for the game if it continues on that way. Looking back through this script, I see what's kinda happened. As I was concentrating on gameplay, I was loving it, and when we moved on to story full on, well, gradually things started to fall apart. And most people, that is pretty much everyone, generally consider disc 1 to be the game's high point. There's still three more to go. We shall see what lies ahead, I suppose. But for now, this video has already gone on way too long, and we will have to end it here. I didn't originally set out to do a multi-part series on Final Fantasy VIII, but now? Well, it turns out that I have quite a lot to say. Bye for now! Ugh, oh, good lord, why am I doing this again? Well, it's the second video of Final Fantasy VIII. This time we're covering Disc 2. All being good, there'll be four videos, one for each disc. Now the first video did go through a pretty big chunk of the gameplay happenings, but there's still a fair bit more in that regard to go through as we go, along with some analysis of our characters as, hopefully, they stop acting like stupid people all of the damn time. But for now, we go back to the plot. We left our group in something of a sticky situation, seeing as our main guy had an icicle through his chest and all that. How's that gonna resolve itself? Well, we don't know yet, because we're starting Disc 2 with Laguna and The Quiet Life. He plays around with a kid named Elone, who's the daughter of someone named Wayne, who nursed him back to health following his big old fall. It's been two years since that happened. They're in a place called Windhill, a very quiet town that's almost empty in fact. Laguna's main job is defending it from thoroughly average monsters. The reason why the town is so barren is because most of the men are at war, which is a sign that these Laguna sequences aren't parallel, they're flashbacks. Around this time, well over 10 years back from the present, there was a big war between Galbadia, who Laguna and company belong to, and a place called Esfar, which we know little about. We were attacked by their soldiers in the last flashback. The nature of the world was changed by the wars, although considering their status, now we can clearly infer that Galbadia won. Kiros comes to visit Laguna, and we get some more revelations. Ward's now a janitor in a prison. Oh, and the subject of Julia comes up, the girl who Laguna wooed at the hotel way back and spent a night with. Apparently, she always spoke of her true love who went to war and never came back, Laguna obviously, and he knows it. But she ended up marrying someone named General Carraway, thus giving us a link between the past and the present. Julia, who we saw at the piano, is Renoa's mother. How this resolves itself isn't necessarily known, but the breakup of this relationship seems to also be a part of the beef between Renoa and her dad. We do a bit of patrolling, and find that Laguna's dreams of travelling the world and being a journalist are fading. He actually wants to settle down. Everything is purposefully uneventful, and he likes that. Rain likes him a lot, but worries that those dreams will take him away. And finally, Laguna worries that one time he's going to wake up, and all of this just won't be there. He'll be somewhere else. Which is an obvious cue for this flashback to end, easily one of the strongest written parts of the game so far. It works out great, beautifully done, and a much needed moment of calm after the events at the end of disc 1. 
Every character in this bit, from Laguna and Kios to Rain, Alone and even the residents of Windhill, none of whom care much for Laguna, are superbly fleshed out in an effortless way that you don't often get with JRPGs. Top Marks Of course in FF8 you do have to take the rough with the smooth, and so it's followed by D District Prison, which is where our group is at. Actually, the character writing does continue to be good here, it's just the level itself that's so horrid, but we'll get to that. Surprisingly, when we come back we're with Zell, who's just waking up from the flashback, not Squall, who isn't here. We're all in jail, we don't have our weapons, we're probably going to be executed, things kind of look rubbish. Zell gets thoroughly abused by a warden, and Renoa gets taken away for god knows what. Finally, we do get to see Squall himself, who is all alone in a different part of the prison. Miraculously, his wounds completely healed. The storyline reason is presumably that a deer healed him, so he could be interrogated about Seed, who a deer absolutely hates for some reason. But this is also the big jump off point for one of the game's more popular fan theories. The one which states that Squall died when he took that spike to the chest, and the rest of the game is his fever dream in the moments before expiration. Eh, no point exploring that now, we'll come back to it when there's more evidence to look at. Still, death is important here. The start of Disc 2 is a knowing echo to how Disc 2 of FF7 started, with the big sense that something is missing. The Windhill flashback and starting out with Zell does make you wonder for a second if the game has actually just killed off Squall completely, until you finally run into him again. It's quite well done. Another intriguing setup with regards to the flashback is that obviously we know Squall was in it playing Laguna as normal, and Zell was too. But Zell didn't play Kiros. He played Ward, who is separate from the others and working in a prison. Kiros was played by Irvine, who we don't know the whereabouts of right now. In fact, it turns out that Ward worked in this prison right here, so Zell knows quite a lot about the prison's layout and how it works. <laughs> how convenient. And then, while the group bemoan not having weapons, Zell suddenly remembers that actually he uses his fists to hit people all of this time, and so he fools the guard into coming in and knocks him out in one hit. <laughs> Again, very convenient. He gets the group's weapons back and we're about ready to begin the prison break. First though we beat the crap out of Biggs and Wedge again, who were demoted after their encounter with us back in Dole, and are now likely to be demoted once more. <laughs> Poor guys. Before that though there's some revelations with Squall and Cypher, who's doing a bit of good old fashioned torture, asking Squall what the purpose of Seed is. But Squall doesn't actually know anything beyond Garden's role as a training school, and Seed are a mercenary group. He can't answer that. Not that Cypher cares. Cypher still thinks of himself as the knight in shining armour, even if Romantic Dream says different, it's more of a mistranslation and he's Adir's protector, not her lover. He's still the classic good guy, only he's an asshole. I didn't mention this previously, but the two characters' costumes and colour coding make the role reversal very clear. Cypher's light coat is replete with Christian insignia, Squall has his dark jackets and Xs. The Squall Cypher rivalry is again where some of the game's strongest writing lies. Another point here is how personal things have become between them. If you were going to logically choose someone to interrogate about Seed first, well you'd obviously choose Quistis. She's been a member of Seed longer than the others, was even an instructor at one point, and so surely knows more about Seed than all the others do. But Cypher chooses Squall because even though he's less likely to know the inner workings, he wants to hurt him, and because, in Cypher's eyes, he is the good guy, and Squall is the villain. Anyway, the big news is that Adir wants Garden to be destroyed, so she's ordered missiles to be launched at both Balaam Garden and Trabia Garden. We haven't been to Trabia, but Selfie was transferred from there. And with that, the breakout begins. We go up and find Squall who gets rescued by a bunch of Moombas, and then we go down only to find we're underground, and we go up again to bump into Renoa and Irvine and yada yada yada. Minor plot things happen, but we'll get to them. I want to talk about how this is such an awful dungeon and what the hell happened to dungeons in this game. Seriously, 90% of the prison is the same floor, copy-pasted. It's like the Shinra HQ staircase in FF7, only mandatory and with random encounters. It's not the only time you get this either. It's the same with the sewers, with the Tomb of the Unknown Kin. Did all the people who made really good dungeons before leave after FF7? Because these are, for the most part, absolute shite. Even without encountering enemies, this dungeon is a pain not just because of its repetition, but how often you have to double back. 
And yes, there is a storyline reason, it is a prison, it's supposed to be disorienting like this, but still it's very poor indeed. Even the boss is literally just a couple of enemies you meet throughout this section. The writing is strong, but the gameplay, very weak indeed. To top it all off, you can literally game over right at the end if you take Squall the wrong way as the prison is moving. I didn't, but imagine not saving and having to do this again because you went left instead of right. Fuck this shitty, awful level. Couple of big plot things that I missed then. The Moombas who rescued Squall greet him with Laguna Laguna for some reason, another link between the past and present. Also, Irvine wasn't captured with the others. He evaded, had his flashback, and then was found by Renoa, who was released from prison on the orders of General Carraway. Anyway, we're finally out of this shithole and in the middle of the desert. Fortunately, we have some jeeps, but there is a crisis on our hands. Missiles are aimed at two gardens. Selfie in particular is very worried. And just as we're getting things organised, well, the first set of missiles launch, the ones aimed at Trabia. Balaam is next. We never had a shot at saving Trabia, and notably the group never fell into argument while the launch happened, but maybe Balaam can be saved. Squall, being the leader, breaks the party into two, one led by himself to go to Balaam and warn them, and the other to go to the nearby missile base and stop or otherwise thwart the launch to be led by Selfie, who as you might expect is in the mood to rip shit up. Getting in the missile base is easy enough, we've got some uniforms and an army vehicle, although ultimately I wasn't that stealthy. There are a couple of ways you can play this bit that involve not really getting seen, but being stealthy I thought it best to start blasting as soon as possible because that's just what she does. She hasn't had that much of the spotlight so far, but Selfie is like, easily my favourite character in the game. She's hilariously childish, sometimes totally ill-suited to a situation, but still ends up actually getting shit done, and she is so cheerful as well. She gets all these funny little touches, like back in the prison when Irvine's having a big shootout with a seemingly endless amount of guards, she's sitting there cross-legged like she's at a bloody picnic, or whenever she bashes at electronics and somehow manages to get shit done, or all of her plans being something along the lines of blow everything up, she's great. And again, I want to stress how brilliant all of these animations are, that's one thing FF8 unquestionably has over FF7 in a big way. FF7 had good stuff too, but FF8? damn they did well here, especially on the PS1. Anyway, while we can't move the missiles away from Balaam, we can set their error ratio to the maximum, meaning they are likelier to miss. And we also achieve the end goal of setting this place to self-destruct, but we end up fighting this big old tank. We win, obviously, but the hunk of metal blocks the way out just as the missiles launch and the base starts to blow up. Things don't look good for Selfie's crew right now. Meanwhile, Squall's lot have reached Balaam, which oddly is already in a state of panic. Nothing to do with the incoming missiles, mind. The garden faculty are staging a coup, and they want to find and kill Sid. This is all down to someone who we haven't met named Nork, the other boss of the garden, the money man. And so we end up fighting a lot of the faculty's monsters while trying to find Sid. We also run into Fujin and Raijin again. They're still on Cypher's side, but apparently haven't found him yet, and they're tasked with trying to get people the hell out of here. In a somewhat outrageous double bluff, Seed have hid Sid right in his office, while pretending that they're hiding him somewhere else in Garden in order to confuse the faculty and buy themselves some time. According to Sid, there is one thing we can do. There's something mysterious down in the basement that even he doesn't know about that could, potentially, save the Garden. Going down there does feel like kind of a suicide mission, but what the hell, what else can we do? And so, yeah, it's another mediocre dungeon. This one based on an endless series of ladders. At least we don't have to fight so much, which is kind of odd, but we'll get to that in a bit. The dungeons by and large just aren't that great so far. Once again, we're confronted with a panel of electronics that we stab at randomly, and suddenly, the garden goes flying. You see, Balaam Garden was built on top of a mobile shelter constructed by an ancient civilization known as the Centra. We explored one of their ruins back in the Second Laguna flashback. And yeah, Centra. I'm not sure if this was a conscious callback to FF7's ancient civilization, the Cetra, or the Ancients, but there is no relation as far as I can tell. Anyway, we set off the controls, and all of a sudden this huge garden is moving. It's now a ship. And thanks to this, plus the efforts of Selfie's group, the missiles miss their mark and end up not harming anyone. Of course, the garden is now floating in the ocean, and no one has the faintest clue about how you actually control the damn thing, but at least we're not dead. We'll just float aimlessly around the ocean until our supplies run out, 
and then we'll starve to death. It's all good. After all this, Squall tries to get a bit of a rest, but is interrupted by Renoa, who's new to the garden and kind of wants a tour. We do that, and once again in the library, well, we meet that girl. The one who we saw in the infirmary right in the beginning, and then saved in the training centre. Strange, she knows us, but we don't know her. And then we're called to meet with Norg himself in the basement. He's... well, he's not happy, putting it mildly, and he's also kind of inhuman. There's a lot of exposition in the big Norg chat. He says that we were essentially played into taking on the mission to assassinate a deer by Martine at Galbadia Garden, for whom our appearance there was somewhat convenient. One of the more shocking reveals, though, that kind of comes out of nowhere, is that a deer is Sid's wife. Huh? Well, that might go some way to explaining why a deer hates Seed so much, seeing as Seed is Sid's baby. Ultimately, though, Norg plans to deal with Adir diplomatically by offering the heads of her would-be assassins on a plate. That being us, so we've got to fight him. Needless to say, this decision does not go well for Norg, and now he's thoroughly dead. This clears up the civil war in the garden, at least. Norg is, or was, a member of a tribe called Lashumi, who we'll presumably run into again at some point. When we meet up with Sid again, the exposition continues. Sid knew full well who Adir was when he married her, but things went well at first and it's implied that she had a big hand in building Garden. And Norg, well, he was important in providing the money to get Garden built, but naturally all that money then had to be paid back, which is the reason why Seed basically became a mercenary group offering their services to the highest bidder. This is why the Garden faculty were so unhappy when we were all shipped off to serve Renoa for a pittance, which ultimately led to the situation we had when we returned to Balaam. It's all tons of dialogue, although it does serve as something of a turning point. As it is, we encounter another ship. We suspect Galbadians at first, but that's not likely. These mysterious people come in peace and they're after someone. A person named Alone, who is at the garden. They want her because she is not safe there. Alona? Yep, the same little girl from the Laguna flashbacks. Who do you think she is now? It's pretty easy to figure it out. She's that mysterious girl who we keep bumping into. And yes, she is the reason why we keep having those flashbacks to Laguna. When Squall meets her again, she says that she wants to change the past. Considering all the things that have been laid on Squall already, he is kind of unhappy about his role in this. Everyone's looking to him as a leader more and more, and we know how uncomfortable he is with that. But apparently, he is Alone's only hope. As she goes with the other folks, that's all we know. And then, to top it all off, Another attempt to just go and have a chilled walk and talk with Renoa is thwarted by Sid calling Squall again and officially laying out the mission at hand. The Garden is now a mobile base with the sole purpose of defeating Galbadia and the Sorceress, and Squall is the leader of that. Everyone in Garden is now under Squall's command, because Squall obviously loves being the leader so much. When it rains, it pours and all that. Before anything else though, our floating ship that we can't control finally crashes ashore, at a place called Fisherman's Horizon. Miraculously, the hulking Great Finn doesn't kill anybody, although obviously we're going to have to go there and make our apologies. <sighs> right, well we'll get into Fisherman's Horizon soon, but for now let's move on to some analysis. One big thing to point out is that all these scenes can play out very differently, dependent on how you split the parties. If you want the most dialogue and lore, then the best thing to do is take Renoa and Quistis with you to bail them, especially Renoa as she's not exactly familiar with the place. But everything plays out very differently if you don't take her. There's a lot of branching paths in the game, which is good for multiple playthroughs. It's also worth noting how often you actually play as other people, as it's quite different from FF7 where, short of the odd battle and the parts where Tifa and Sid were in charge of the party, you were basically always Cloud. By this stage of the game, everyone has had a shot at leading the group, or they've flown solo, with the exception of Irvine, and he'll get one too. It works well, especially if you think of FF8 as more of an ensemble than just a story that's based on one or two people, although we'll see how that holds up. Now a big theme throughout this disc so far has been not just the continuing transition of Squall from passive grunt to something of a leader, but the transformation of Seed itself, and what its goals are. Throughout Disc 1, we were always under contract for all of our jobs and tasks. That didn't change until Disc 2, when the party splits into two and goes to the Missile Base and Balaam. That's the first time we've done something that's not under a contract. We did it because it's important to us, what we have to do. 
The game doesn't make a hubbub about it, but it's the first time that we've done something for an actual cause. The old ways of Seedlin naturally change with the death of Norg, but yeah, things are, at least for now, a little more conventional. Good against evil and all that. Even if we still actually don't know anything about Adia aside from her being Sid's wife. The changes in Squall are also carried off pretty well. While he's still not comfortable with being a leader, you notice the differences in conversations and how he talks to people, unless he's thinking about it too much. It's like he becomes more active without realising it, or discussions that would probably end up disintegrating into an argument do not. Going back to the split mission, one touch I like is that it would be obvious to have everybody bickering just as the missiles are launched towards Trabia. That'd happen in Disc 1 for sure. But it doesn't. They're trying to get organised, but they just never had the time to stop what happened there. It's a sign of the group's growing cohesiveness and maturity. We're about halfway through Disc 2 already, and the plot is still moving along fine. Story-wise, the game has actually recovered quite well from the unending stupidity that happened at the end of Disc 1. What hasn't recovered, mind, is the gameplay. That's gone considerably downhill. I already mentioned the dungeons. So far they are very lacklustre indeed. The best one we've had so far is still probably the first seed exam, if that even counts. Traditional ones are just copy-pasted rubbish, and that's quite disappointing. As far as the game breaking goes, that's still sort of a thing, but it's so straightforward that by this stage, there's not much you really have to do. Soon everybody's got tons of HP and can do tons of damage, and you only need three setups like that, which you then just switch around your party depending on who you're controlling. And that's another big problem. Every character in FF8 largely starts out as a blank slate, with only minor differences in stats. So you can build whatever party you want, but in the end they're all interchangeable so it doesn't matter all that much who you pick. Characters aren't important, just setups. The only other thing that really changes things then is the limits, all of which are indeed very different depending on the character you're using. Christus has her enemy skills, Renoa uses her dog, Selfie gets to cast spells at random, Irvine uses ammunition that you find in the world, Zell hits the enemy with the help of fighting game style combos. That's all different and good, but it's not really enough. And really, by this stage, you might not even be getting into fights anyway. Diablos, the GF that you find in a lamp that Sid gives you, has two thoroughly broken fins that you can learn. Ink half, and after that, ink none. The first halves the random encounter rate, and the second takes it out completely. They're not difficult to learn, and Diablos is not a difficult fight if you've played the way I have. Once you've learned Ink None, well that's it. As long as you have it on, the only enemies you'll ever fight are bosses and other fixed encounters. And I find that, well, baffling. Why include it? It's almost an admission of how bad the dungeons are. Here, use this and you can just run through them as quickly as possible without the added ordeal of fighting. Or that the system in the game is just, in general, quite broken. You could say that, well, you won't gain levels anymore. But gaining levels is on the whole bad because enemies level up with you. There is literally no practical reason not to use this ability once you've learned it. The only reason that I will ever take it off is to at least get the flavour of places we go to by seeing the battle scenes, monsters and whatnot. But honestly? The battle side of gameplay by this point is just about over. The only thing that's really there from now is to see just how much more you can break the thing. And, you know, there is a limit to how much I want to spend playing cards and stuff like that. It's not all bad, mind. We do have the story, and all the character analysis and plot and all that. Let's just get into that. Fisherman's Horizon is quite a cool place, a man-built structure that functions as an island, populated entirely by peace-loving mechanics. The mechanics part is good. Of all the places we could have crashed into in the world, it is very convenient that we crash into the place filled with people who can probably fix our shit up and get us moving. Mind you, our reputation does precede us, and we are unpopular for more reasons than cosmetic damages. We are mercenaries, and our presence immediately brings fear to these peaceful folks that we're going to screw shit up somehow and bring some assholes over. When the first thing out of the mayor's mouth is, when are you folks going to leave, that's not really a sign that you're welcome. As it is, however, Galbadian soldiers do come to the horizon. Interestingly, though, they're not after Seed. They're after Elone, the girl who's making us dream of Laguna. In fact, we're almost an afterthought. The Galbadians act like assholes, say they're just going to burn this place to the ground anyway, even though the fishermen obviously know nothing, and naturally we intervene and beat them off. 
The Galbadians also carry a beaten up piece of shit vessel known as the Ironclad with them which, as it turns out, was also housed in a disguised selfie, Irvine and Quistis, meaning that the full band is back together. Hooray! Squall is legitimately thoroughly pleased to see that they made it back, something that Renoa comments on, not because she's surprised that Squall was concerned, but because it's Squall once again showing that despite what he thinks, he actually can take the lead. As it is, we're not done here. There's plenty to do in Fisherman's Horizon while we're waiting for the ship to be fixed, including one of the single, arseholiest moments in the game. Mayor Dobe tried to deal with the Galbadian soldiers the way he knew best, through discussion and reasoning, and it failed. Squall can take this opportunity to condescendingly explain to him about how what he does is very necessary and that we should be able to look past each other's differences and all that like he's Brad fucking Paisley. It's brilliantly prickish. The guy nearly had his whole town razed to the ground, but whatever, it's an important lesson that he must learn. When Squall beats the absolute piss out of a G-Soldier with a complete overkill Renza Kuken, it means something. Ah, Squall, you are such an asshole. Needless to say, Mayor Dobe doesn't have anything to say in response, although I don't think it's because he's thinking about it. I should stress that the way the scene plays out does make this reading feel like the correct one. It's another bit of fun right in exploring one of Squall's many faults, his complete failure to connect with people and not say things that may be logically correct but are emotionally bullshit. Aside from that, Fisherman's Horizon is a big place with lots of little things to explore. It kinda sums up the game's commitment to local flavour and extra dialogue. Virtually every waypoint in the Fisherman's Horizon quest comes with an entirely new set of lines for the town's NPCs, and this isn't even a long quest. There's a whole storyline with the Fisherkin, who you see in the FMV when Garden crashes into town, that you'll easily miss if you don't go down a very hard to spot ladder right in the beginning. You can also find Martine here, the ex-headmaster of Galbadia Garden. He's actually been kicked out of there and is now contemplating early retirement at Horizon. And here's a big example. There's this bit where you're in control of Irvine only, while he judges what musical instrument members of our party should play. He's only useful in this one screen. And yet at this time, you can take Irvine around the town and again, there'll be an entirely new set of lines dealing with Irvine walking around the place solo. It's crazy attention to detail, and you can easily miss tons of it, as I did. Final Fantasy VIII is maddeningly inconducive to video capture because of this. Anyway, yeah, musical instruments. The rest of the group are trying to do something nice while we're waiting for things to happen. Partly to try and cheer Squall up a little, partly to kinda work at getting Squall and Renoa together, and also kinda for Selfie as well. Considering that her home garden is very likely in ruins, she's kinda down in the dumps. Irvine doesn't care much about that though and sees this as an opportunity to make a Mac move on her cause he fancies her. I haven't mentioned it much but this is as good a point as any to stress that I do not like Irvine and he is easily my least favourite character in the entire game. Hell, I think I like General Carraway's puzzle loving guard more than I like Irvine. Anyway this is another little puzzle where you get a set of instruments that go together for a fast piece and another that's best for a slow piece and there's multiple outcomes for the scene depending on what you choose. The one that's good is very specific indeed, it's a mixture of the two and it's really hard to get. I didn't manage it, and so the concert kinda goes a bit pear shaped. Renoa and Squall end up having another argument because Squall is still struggling to make that big connection, something deep within is stopping it. We get little clues to it now, it's obviously something connected to childhood and little flashbacks while Squall is sleeping point to a huge loss in his childhood, presumably of a sister. Elone wants to change the past completely in a literal way, while Squall is carrying the burden and struggling to make that mental change. And so, we're done with Fisherman's Horizon. Not only have the mechanics fixed the boat up, but they've shown us how to control it. We can move again! Woohoo! Now this is actually a big moment, it's the first time after a long stretch that we've really been able to relax or backtrack to old places we want to go to. Really, the storyline hasn't stopped moving forward since we first went to Timber. We've been on a one-way path ever since through Dealing City, the prison, all the flashbacks, back to Balaam Garden, and now to Horizon. That's a long frickin' time. Now that the garden can be moved, we can pretty much go anywhere. It can traverse the ocean, but it can also hover over ground as long as there's a nice low area like a beach that it can climb onto. It's like a considerably better tiny bronco. 
And so while it is suggested that we should go back to the town of Balaam and see what's happening there, we're obviously not going to do that straight away. There's some things we ought to do. It wouldn't be a Final Fantasy game without side quests after all. First thing I do is clear up that Tomb of the Unknown King quest, which kind of sums up the game's awful dungeons so far. It's a maze where every screen is virtually identical, and the maze part is entirely obviated because you can literally go right at every chance you get, solving the little puzzles along the way, and then once you find yourself back out of the tomb, go back in and go straight to the centre for the final womb. The reward for this is another GF, Brothers, which is pretty much the last one I need to ensure that all three of my setups involve high HP, high strength, and hitting everything in the game like a freaking dump truck. We'll still be getting more, mind you. Speaking of GFs, there is a couple of classic series ones we can get right now by going south to a place called the Central Ruins. It's a big old tower dungeon that's mostly based around a puzzle, and hey, it's not all copy-pasted. It looks quite nice in fact. Shame it's optional. Anyway, the Central Ruins are mainly home to Odin. As soon as you get there you have 20 minutes to find him and defeat him. The puzzle itself is simple enough, and to be honest there's lots of time to fight Odin. If you've never had a fight against him in any FF game then it pretty much goes like this. You have a set time to beat him, during which he will do nothing, but he has very high defence. If you don't beat him in the time, he absolutely murders you with Zantetsuken or Iron Cutting Sword. No matter what defences you have, this is instant death. Of course it's kind of easy for us to beat him in that time, but Odin is one of the few monsters from which you can draw triple magic, which is one of the best junctions in the game. Naturally we do that for a bit too before beating him. Odin works differently to other GFs, he doesn't learn any skills. Instead once you have him, there's a chance that he'll interrupt a battle and just flat out kill your opponents with Zantetsuken. We won't see it much seeing as he doesn't do it against bosses, but it's still cool to have a Norse god on your side. Central Ruins is kind of the home to FF's passive monsters. The other GF you can win here is Tonberry. Ah, Tonberry. My favourite enemy in the whole Final Fantasy series. He's cute, he wears a hoodie, and his main attack is to slowly walk up to you and once he gets up close, he fucking stabs you to death. Lemmy would love this little guy. Fucking come here and fucking stab me, you fucking bomb. <laughs> Tonberries also have another attack, a counter called Everyone's Grudge, which damages characters based on how many monsters they've killed, in terms of having personally delivered the finishing blow. Used on Renoa here, it's somewhat negligible. She's not delivered many final blows. When it's used on Squall, however, it's a one hit knockout. I freaking love Tonberries. Anyway, this is kinda dull, you just fight a random amount of Tomberries, ideally one-shotting them with limit breaks before they can use the grudge. I should note that in one of these fights I managed to hit the 999 mark with a critical hit on Blasting Zone, the most powerful of Squall's finishers that I have. Unfortunately I wasn't recording at the time, which is a pisser. After about 20 or so Tomberries, you fight the Tomberry Kin. He's bigger and actually aggressive, although still not a difficult fight. Beat him and you get the Tomberry GF. It's quite a tedious quest and the GF isn't even all that good in the end, but I had to do it, just because it's Tomboy, to be honest with you. Onwards to more plot related areas. At this stage you might want to pop over to Galbadia Continent and pay a quick visit to Windhill, the place we saw in Laguna's last flashback. Maybe there'll be some clues there. The monsters aren't there anymore as it goes, but nor is Laguna, and nor is Wayne. The town seems a little friendlier towards outsiders than it was in Laguna's day, although it is still a case of being tolerated. Through a bit of asking around we don't actually find out a lot about what happened to Laguna, but we do find out that Wayne is no longer with us, having passed away a few years ago. We don't know why though. Is that why we're having the dreams? I guess we'll find out more in a later flashback. Other than that you can of course revisit all the other areas. You can go and see how Dolly's doing, how Timber's doing, even head straight into Dealing City without a care. There's bits of new dialogue to be had all over, and if you're interested in that then it's certainly worth doing, along with various little side quests and what have you. If you want to continue with plot though, you've got to go to Balaam Town. As much as I could have you watch me screw around with bones, dogs and cards for another 15 minutes, we kinda should do that. One last thing to notice that if you go to where Galbadia Garden was, you'll find a hole in the ground there too. That was obviously built on a similar shelter to our one, and I guess that they figured out the secret. If you put two and two together, and add Martin being kicked out of there, then it's quite likely that Galbadia's garden is under the control of a deer by now. 
As we reach Balaam, you might well notice that Galbadia Garden is here too, thus bearing out what I just said. The town's under Galbadian control. Once again they're looking for a loan and threatening the town with violence, even though it is pretty clear that no one has the faintest idea of what's going on. We blag that we have info to get in and try to do the same to get to the commander, but we need to pay our respects to the captain first. It's another rather humdrum puzzle bit, with Zeller's the obvious mandatory inclusion in the party. This is his hometown after all. On speaking with his ma, we get a clue to the commander's identity. She has grey hair and is wearing an eye patch, meaning it's Fujin, and presumably she and Waijin, obviously the captain, manage to find Cypher and get themselves a position. You find Waijin after finding out that he's cooked fish in the Dink's kitchen, then you give that scent to a dog who chases him out, and you end up fighting them and blah blah blah. The Fujin Waijin fight can actually be tricky if you don't have your junctions set up properly, but it's not much of a big deal. The scene that plays out is kind of interesting. Fujin and Waijin aren't interested at all in what Adia's doing, and they're sticking with Cypher because they're basically his only friends. It's all about loyalty, which gives Squall some thought. Loyalty is the one big thing that he's never believed in. He doesn't think or even understand the concept of people just sticking with each other through thick and thin, although it's gradually starting to make more sense. One of those things that's not spelt out, much like Squall not really caring about what happens to Balaam, really. In the end, we let them all go with the proviso that the next time we all meet, that probably won't happen. We're kind of at a loose end, but Selfie's recovered from her rest, and there's one place that she wants to go. We have to go north, to Travia Garden, or whatever's left of it. Selfie has still been her usual cheerful self, although it's clearly taken a bit of effort right now. Now we've not really been north at all yet, and there's a bunch of stuff we can see here if we want, such as the Shumi village where Norg came from. We'll get there, but for now we're probably all curious as to what happened in the other garden. Even from the world map, things don't look good, and on getting there it's plain to see that the garden was directly hit by those missiles. Trabia has what remains of a halo on it too, meaning that it's possible that if anyone knew about it, the garden could have flown away from danger. Selfie remains cheerful while exploring the garden's ruins, there's still a lot of people around trying to make the best of the situation, and Selfie's excited to see her friends. There's various little moments where Selfie is encouraging people to keep strong and cheerful, setting an example. And then there's the graveyard where Trabia's been burying the dead. Lots of Selfie's friends are here too, and she talks to them, which is, uh, yeah, kind of upsetting. Eventually though, we all meet up in the basketball court. At first things progress as you would expect. Selfie wants to be with us when we fight the sorceress, because she wants her revenge. That's fine enough, and it certainly doesn't lead you to expect what comes next. This is the game's livestream moment. Tons of plot revelation is inbound, and it's going to come thick and fast, but I'll try to stick with it and break it down as much as I can. Winoa is the first to speak out, and wonders why we actually have to fight, or rather if that's the only way. This is more to do with a difference she seems to feel from the rest of the group, that when they all fight, it's as if they're possessed by something, whereas she's more wondering if everything's going to be okay. This little bit is sort of like the camera zooming out. Because we always get squalls in a monologue, we tend to think of him as the outsider in a way, because he concentrates on the little details that make him different from the others. This isn't true. Renoa is and always has been the outsider, because she didn't have the upbringing of anyone else in the group. Everyone else grew up in Garden. Garden takes in and teaches children from a very young age. Garden is all most of them have known, except Rinoa, and although Rinoa has fought, she's experienced more than just fighting, or learning how to fight. Rinoa's question isn't one the group can answer. Fighting just comes naturally to us. For the group, there is nothing before or after Garden and Seed. Except for one of us. And funnily enough, it's the one who's kinda just been tagging along this whole time, seemingly only caring about guns and women, and generally being rather shit. None of the group remember anything from childhood other than Garden, but they weren't born there, and yet they've forgotten how they got there. All of them, except for Irvine. There's a reason why Irvine has in particular been very strongly after Selfie, and it's because of his memories. Irvine and Selfie, when they were very young, were in the same orphanage. Once the connection between Irvine and Selfie is established, memories start to jog. Quistis was there too. And Zell. And Squall. You might wonder about Zell being there seen as we've seemingly met his ma, but the answer is of course that he was adopted. 
All of them are close to the same age, and they were all in the same place. They're all orphans. We do not know why they are orphans, or whether it's never spelt out, but all of our characters were born during a long and bloody war between Galbadia and Estvar. The answer probably lies low in. Wars leave a lot of orphans behind. We see scenes from the orphanage as the group remembers. There's another little tidbit. When we see the young squall, he's talking about Sis again, and how much he misses her. Sis is not so much connected to the reason why Squall's at the orphanage to begin with. She was someone at the orphanage. Squall constantly shouts to the unseen matron, asking when Sis is going to come back, and so forth. Also, it turns out that Cypher was at the orphanage. And we see that in all this time, the characters and the relationships between them haven't changed a lot. Zell and Cypher, for example, have always absolutely hated each other. Cypher used to pick on him all the time. But if you ask them both, they probably wouldn't be able to tell you why they dislike each other so much. It's an example of their childhoods being rather stunted and broken. Whenever Squall and Cypher, or Cypher and Zell, see each other, something just takes over from within. It's why Selfie's always naturally cheerful, or why Christus is more indecisive and was so flirty with Squall in the beginning. She thought she was in love at one point, or that there was some deep connection between them. They can't put their finger on it, but it all comes from the orphanage. The big question, of course, is why exactly does Irvine, of all people, remember all this? Why does no one else remember? And why didn't he tell anyone? For Irvine, the difference between him and everyone else is clear. Guardian forces. GFs are something we've only really discussed in gameplay terms up to this point, but as with most anything in FF, there is a big attempt to justify them in story. And indeed, it turns out that they play a pretty big role. Irvine, you see, hadn't ever used a GF until he met us. They didn't use them at Galbadia Garden. Selfie confesses that while they don't use them at Trabia, she did find one during a mission and used it for quite a while. But the Balaam students, well, they've been using them virtually non-stop. Balaam and Seed are indeed the only force in the world who use Guardian Forces. As we've seen from gameplay, Guardian Forces heavily augment a person's ability. For us, they've completely broken the game. If you took those Guardian Forces away, the now party wouldn't be much stronger than the average G-Soldier. They latch onto people's minds, essentially building a different, more capable person. It turns out, however, that they do have something of a negative effect on memories. While the question of dropping GFs does come up during this chat, we all know that's impossible. We are utterly dependent on them. But of course, there is a morality issue here. Seed are meant to be more than just mercenaries. Guardian forces turn them into super soldiers, artificially, from a young age. This should be one of those big things to really clue you in that Sid Kramer, the headmaster at Balaam, and a fervent advocate of GFs, is not exactly as nice or as bumbling a guy as he might initially appear. As for Irvine, well, it became awkward once he realised that we weren't clearly suppressing our memories of each other, that instead none of us actually remembered a damn thing. It's been building up to now. Up next on the revelation menu, the identity of Sis. We know she's someone who was at the orphanage, meaning she's roughly our age. She stopped being there, so perhaps a little older. And she is, of course, inextricably linked with our group, with Squall in particular. There's two people it can be, really, and if it were in Noah, then I'd have probably turned the game off then and there. But of course, it's alone. We don't know about the Guna, but we know that Rain has been dead for years. Perhaps that explains why Alone's been able to get into our heads in such a way. Also, not being particularly combat-oriented, she isn't bound by GFs either. In the couple of times that Squall and Alone have met, Alone remembered him clearly. What isn't yet explained is why Adir wants her so badly. And so we come to the final revelation that all of this has been building up to. All these people went to an orphanage. They all went to Garden. Most of them to a garden built up by Sid Kramer with his wife, Adir. And so, back in the orphanage, Adir Kramer was the matron. She is a mother figure to them all, something very important that they had all forgotten. She wasn't a bully or possessive or anything either, just a regular matron. Something clearly happened, although none of us know what that is. But it explains a few things. Going back to when we very first saw her, when she took control of Cypher, was that really mind control? Or was it simply a deer knowing exactly how she could control him, taking him straight back to his childhood? There's now a big family angle in Cypher's protection of a deer too, and his role as the knight. 
When we fought Adia, she spoke to us and dismissed us like we were naughty children. And when she basically killed Squall with an icicle to the chest, she revived him to the point where the wound never actually existed. A big part of that was undoubtedly motherly instinct. And so not only do we all have a big childhood link to each other that's naturally brought us together, but we have that link to our enemies. And undoubtedly, it is because of our enemies that we are together now. It's important that we don't forget it. Now that the revelations are over, and we are fully aware of the reason why we have to fight, Winoa feels even more like the odd one out. And yet she kind of isn't in a way. Much like FF7, all of this squad are now thoroughly broken in some way. They all had stunted, incomplete childhoods, half of which they can't even remember. Rinoa is perhaps now something to aspire to, a representation of a possible future, not just for Squall, but for the whole of the group, a way that they can be whole again. This isn't necessarily something that makes her better as a character, but it is a justification, a reason for her to keep coming along with us. And with that, the revelations are done. We will now travel to Adia's house, where perhaps we can find out more on just what happened to change the matron we knew, Adia Kramer, into Sorceress Adia. Next time, anyway. After all those plot points, it is time to break it all down, generally. This is the big point where the themes of Final Fantasy VIII assert themselves, surprisingly late on, virtually in the middle of the game, in fact. Orphaned children, war babies, the lack of a proper childhood and how it affects people, makes them insular and untrusting, trying to make people into something they aren't, the effects that loss can have. Some of these themes are shared with FF7, although approached from a different angle. FF7 explored the short-term effects of loss, while FF8 deals more with the long-term and how people cope in a more abstract way, not necessarily just loss through death. There's subtle licks of it everywhere, even down to how people reacted in the short time that Cypher was thought to be dead, when Squall tried to reject the thought that in the end, people just become a distant memory. One thing that surprises people about FF8 is that, unlike a lot of FF games that are usually quite collaborative efforts, the scenario of FF8 was largely written by Kazushige Nojima alone. The somewhat fragmented nature of the game certainly makes that surprising at times. The plot can seem ridiculous. Squall suddenly finding himself in such a high position and leading the garden is often one of the big negatives that people point out, just for example. But there is often justification. Squall was the only real choice for that job, in all honesty. Who else could have done it? But we'll get to that. For now, while we're not quite at the end of Disc 2, it is perhaps a good idea to stop this video here and let all of these revelations sit. When we return, it'll be time for our leader to go to war. Bye for now. Okay, we're back. When we left the group, we'd just had the big plot reveal moment. To briefly sum up, everybody in the group except Renoa and including Cypher were together as children in an orphanage. Adir was our matron, and Alone was also there as Sis, although we didn't see her. Most of the party had forgotten this because of the Guardian forces that we've been using since childhood in order to make ourselves into super soldiers, but one person hadn't, Irvine, and it's been bothering him for so long until now, when finally he decided to tell us. That's the Cliff Notes version. The scene is one of the game's most famous, or some would perhaps say infamous, scenes. Unlike the livestream moment in FF7, it's not one that's popular. I broke it down and analysed it somewhat while it was happening, but for the sake of moving it along, I purposefully avoided problems until now. Because, you know, there are a few. Now I don't hate the scene like a lot of people do. In the universe and the story that the game is trying to tell, I think a lot of it makes sense. Not all, but a lot. One complaint against it is that in the end, a lot of the revelations don't really matter much, in that it doesn't particularly matter that Alone was at the orphanage, and at the end of the day, despite knowing that Adir is the matron, we're still going to fight her, even kill her. And that's perhaps true. It's certainly valid to ask what's actually changed as a result of these revelations, and truthfully, not much has. But then they do add very important backgrounds and motivation, especially seeing as we knew nothing of Adir really, if you think about it. All we knew was that she was Sid's wife, and that doesn't explain why she's such a big bad villain. What we know now doesn't either, but it at least increases the level of curiosity. The two big problems that do hurt the scene are very identifiable, the whole Guardian Forces explanation, and the role of Irvine himself. Seriously, why didn't he ever say anything? Let's go for the Guardian Forces first and how they eat your brain. 
I think that for a lot of people playing this, the negative effects of GFs can come completely out of the blue here. If this is the first time you've heard about it in the game, then it comes as totally out of left field. Whether you've heard about it depends on how much time you've spent chatting to people. The issue of GFs causing brain damage does come up a couple of times, but if you've not been talking to anyone, you may not know that. If you have, there's still issues, although it can at least illuminate some aspects of the plot, such as how you should actually feel about Sid Kramer, the man who raises these child soldiers and augments their brains. Again, and this is a question I posed right when we were first looking at Seed, what about all the people that don't make it? Sid is not a nice man. In fact, Sid is a total scumbag. It almost makes more sense for him to be the true villain of FF as opposed to Adia. FF8, as we know, strives for subtlety. There is so much that you miss if you don't talk to people. But this... it's a bit too far. Even just one line that you had to see could have been enough. You could have even done it in Christus's class right at the beginning. And then it's, well, something that everyone can recall. So, you know, that probably should have been there. The other issue is that while you can justify the GFs being damaging to the folks who grew up in Balaam, when Selfie says that, oh, she picked one up while she was in Trabia... That is a reach, a big one, way too much of one. It's far too convenient and it cheapens the whole thing. The GF thing is kind of a consequence of FF8 having to justify everything that happens in gameplay in story, and when you're spinning that level of bullshit, you wonder if it would be easier for everyone to have just, you know, forgotten. Back in the orphanage our characters are all around 3 to 4 years old. Most people don't remember or have very faint memories from that age. Not all, mind. Some people remember a little more. Would it have been better for Irvine to be that way? Or not to remember everything as he seems to, but for him to just remember a little more, enough to collectively jog everyone else's memory so that gradually they piece everything together without having the whole GF thing? I reckon that might have been better. At least then you don't have to resort to such silly conveniences. The GF thing does more bad than good, to be honest. It introduces some bad contrivances and cheapens a few relationships. Zell and Cypher, for example, doesn't matter as much when there's this big hand-wavy reason as to why they don't like each other. Irvine, of course, is another problem, perhaps the biggest one. There's just no valid reason for him to bring up virtually nothing about the shared childhood he knows everything about until now. Again, you could argue that there are very subtle hints that the way he acts with Selfie is over-familiar, especially right after they've met, but even there he's kind of equally over-familiar with Renoa, who has nothing to do with any of this, so it doesn't register. Again, would it have hurt to have just a flicker of recognition? Irvine as a character in our party is kind of on shaky ground as it is. It's just too convenient that he ends up getting picked to join our party, and even more so that he was then connected to the party the whole time. But that's not the worst thing. Let's go back to Dealin City, the assassination attempt. Irvine and Squall in the crowd, with a deer right there for the world to see. Squall doesn't recognise her, but Irvine obviously does. Or should. There needs to be a flicker of recognition for Irvine that she is matron, and there isn't at all. Even when Irvine starts to choke, something that again puts him on shaky ground because we wonder how he's Galbadia's best sniper if he's so prone to choking, why isn't it mentioned that the choking is, at this point, because Irvine is tasked with killing Matron, a mother figure, who he knows? Why doesn't it come up? It's not like everything has to pull out Len, even. Irvine could blurt out Matron, and Squirrel wouldn't know what the fuck he was talking about, but it would give us an important hint, and then less of this whole thing would just come from nowhere. I admire FF8's dedication to subtlety, I really do, but there are a lot of times where it just goes way too far. And even that, perhaps, is not the worst thing. What about the D-District prison? Irvine was ordered to pick Renault up from prison by General Calway, and so he did that. And apparently, he initially planned to return Renault to him until Renault convinced him to help with breaking the party out of jail. So yeah, our childhood friend, the one who knows all of this and is closer to the party than they truly know, was kind of all set to leave us in prison to rot and probably be executed. It's only thanks to the one person who he comparatively barely knows that he came back and helped. Nice, huh? That's one serious frickin' ball drop. Considering Irvine's relationship to the party, how the hell did that get in there? Was it just a mistranslation? I mean, you hope so, because goddamn. Irvine. 
He's just very badly written and terrible as a character. Thinking about it, after all his vomiting of plot exposition, I have even less reason to like him than I did previously, and I really didn't like him before. I hate him now. In the end, the whole thing is what it is. It's one of FF8's big turning points, where all of our party get a serious dose of characterisation, where the themes of the game actually come into focus. It's not terrible, but it's not without flaws. And, you know, we're no further along after it. And perhaps that is disappointing, especially if you compare it to the livestream, FF7's big moment where just about everything came together, and the main character truly at last became whole. Mind you, there are still obviously lots more plot points to come. It should be noted, by the way, that the character who benefits most from this whole scene is undoubtedly Squall. It is in many ways his true breaking point, and his admission that things were kind of screwed up. Again, it's subtle, you might not notice it still, but there is that one line admitting that, no, in actuality Squall was not okay at all. Now you might have noticed that, unlike quite a few people, I have a lot of time for Squall as a character, and I'm interested in his development more than just about anything else, and this scene is a big part of that. As for how this scene will affect what's to come, for that we must continue playing. Our next storyline destination is Adia's house down south, which obviously means we're going just a little ways further north and hitting up Shumi village. Shumi is an optional place, we don't have to go there at all in fact at pretty much any point in the game, but it's nice to come here as a little stopgap in the midst of all the revelations. And again there's plot points here that you might miss. Also, it has a draw point where you can get Ultima, one of the best spells in the game, as it often is in FF. Although here, that obviously means for Junction, and as <laughs> we don't use offensive spells, I don't think I've used an offensive spell since the start of Disc 1. <laughs> anyway, Shumi is a very pretty place indeed, filled with kind and welcoming Shumis. Also, a sculptor's working on a statue for the Guna. It turns out that at some point he wound up here after having to be taken care of again. This is also why those Moombas helped Squall out back in the prison. Shumis eventually evolve into something else, and most of them become Moombas. They obviously sensed a connection between Laguna and Squall. We can help with this statue by collecting a few stones, and going on a nice quest that's mostly designed to welcome us to Shumi and get to know their nice non-human people. It's a simple side quest, but it's one that's very much worth doing. It's a lovely place, one of the best looking in the game. Another little stop for us is in Deelin, where it's worth paying a visit to General Carraway. At first he only asks us to take care of Winoa, but he does offer some useful background that I've not yet gone into. As has become clear, there are a lot of connections to the Sorceress War, a time when Galbadia fought Estar, who are under the control of a sorceress named Adele. Esfar is somewhere on the eastern continent that we've not paid a visit to yet, but it has disappeared from view. Galbadia ultimately won the war by making herself as powerful as she could possibly become, and they did this by taking over just about every other city they could. It's an important note on just how Galbadia became so powerful. They did it in order to combat a force that was, presumably, far greater, and perhaps even more dangerous. But in the aftermath, well, they ended up just becoming more and more of a militaristic dictatorship. With the rise of a deer, Galbadia itself isn't even really in control anymore. They're in a very confused state. Anyway, our next regular plot destination is in the southwest, the Centra area, in other words. Adia's orphanage is there near a lighthouse. We can go there, but we can't enter. Why? Because just a little ways away, Galbadia Garden is sitting and waiting. And so the inevitable happens. If Galbadia Garden is here, that obviously means that Cypher and Adia are there too. Everything's been building up to another big fight, and the planet is just not big enough for two massive floating ships running about. It's time for war! As the two gardens spot each other, Squall has to deliver an address and get his people ready for a fight. You get to pick the orders, although it doesn't change an awful lot. It merely emphasises the big task and the responsibilities that Squall has to take, literally head-on, as Balaam rams into Galbadia Gardens field, where Cypher awaits on the brig in a perfect mirror image. As the fight begins, competence is still very much struggling to assert itself. Apparently Zell is asleep. He's obviously not, but for some reason that's being covered up. We motivate troops and stop them from dawdling around, we go to the quad where Zell actually is, and then to the front gate where we expect Galbadian troops to attack from. As far as control goes, we start with Zell's team, including Renoa. Zell gives Renoa a ring that he's borrowed from Squall, although we don't exactly know the significance. 
Anyway, one of the silliest moments in the whole game follows. The two gardens collide, and a piece breaks off of the quad. One that just so happens to have Renault on it, leaving her dangling and out of action. Considering what we know about Renault and her willingness to fight and actually get shit done in spite of everything, this kind of feels like a very cheap way to just get rid of her for the next bit that's not in line with what's been going on. Suddenly she's the silent movie damsel hanging off the cliff waiting for someone to come. And so having screwed the pooch yet again, Zell now has to go and find Squall to tell him that Renault is in trouble and hope that he doesn't immediately rense a kook in his ass. Squall doesn't take the news particularly well, especially as the enemy are here and everyone else is fighting, but news that they've breached the classroom on the second floor means that it can't even take priority now, despite Irvine as usual being a shithead. It's important to note how stacked the odds are against us. Balaam's primary force, Seed, is a small group that's built for external missions, and so the majority of people at Balaam are just cadets, young cadets. Galbadia Garden doesn't have seats, instead they have a group who have all been trained for combat as a large mass, basically it's an army. And if you chatted with Martine earlier, you'll know that it's not really a garden anymore. He and most of the other students were kicked out so that Adia and Cypher could use it as a base. But even before that, the place was essentially a military academy pumping out soldiers for the G-Army. So, you know, we're not fighting fellow garden students here. We're fighting G-soldiers, paratroopers, rocket bikers, and the best of Galbadia's army. While one seed is potentially worth about 50 of them, we only have a handful at our disposal. Cadets can only defend against them for so long. After thwarting the second wave, it's clear that Balaam won't last another. And so we make the decision to attack, to ram straight into Galbadia Garden and swarm on them as much as possible. Squall relays this to the Garden in what certainly counts for him as an inspirational speech, the strongest confirmation yet of his leadership. Oh, by the way, Renault is still Han in there. I really hope she's got some strong delts. I suppose we should save her, shouldn't we? According to the group, Squall is the only one who can do this for, um, reasons. And so he goes to do so. But on the way, he ends up getting bullied by this one troop. Ultimately, the fight sprawls out onto a rope, thus beginning a really frickin' annoying minigame where you punch and kick this guy, timing blocks when necessary that is very easy to fail. Fortunately, failure is not a game over. After winning, Squall finally manages to save Winnow at least, and they land on the front of Galbadia Garden, thus beginning a really awesome sequence as they run through the battle. We can see that the decision to attack was a smart one, as Balaam's cadets are getting the better of a Galbadian force that didn't expect this aggression. Perhaps Squall's speech had something to do with it. Renault returns that win to Squall, by the way. It seems like it's yet another attempt to get the two together that, by this stage, might not exactly be needed. Especially when, you know, there's a freaking battle going on. I mean, priorities, people. Finally, we join the rest of our party inside of Galbadia Garden. The garden itself is surprisingly pretty sparse. There's not many people here at all. Again, this bears out the idea that most of the students were dismissed once Cypher and Adir took over. But it does mean that for the most part, it's another quite boring dungeon where not a lot's happening and most of the screens are the same. The main gimmick is that you have to find a couple of students milling around who are on your side and in possession of keycards so that you can gain access to the headmaster's room. You also fight a GF along the way, Cerberus. Fujin and Raijin are here too, but despite what we said last time, they really don't want to fight. As loyal as they are to Cypher, they recognise just how much he's changed, and they're not here to fight for a deer. This is something of a depressing bit for them. Even the usually eager to fight Fujin is, quite simply, fatigued. In the end, we just leave them. Finally though, we get to the Master's room. Cypher is eager to fight, while Adir is relaxed and cocky. Cypher still sees us as the monsters and himself as the knight, with the added impetus of having not forgotten his upbringing. He knows who Adir is, which makes him all the more motivated to protect her. The Cypher fight is a bigger challenge than it was the first time, even if there's three of us and one of him, but ultimately he fails. Adia dismisses him as foolish and then descends into the auditorium. Once again, she talks to us as though we were mere bugs to be crushed under her feet. It is odd though, in a way. She actually does not bring up the past at all, for as big a thing as it's become for us. But we can't think about the past either. We have to fight her again. Cypher still tries to defend her, although he's less used now. Nothing can stop the big fight to the death, which, naturally, we do win. Adia's tough, but we can handle it. 
But before she can be finished off, something happens again. Adia steps back, stricken, hurt, and notably different. Something, quite visibly, has been lifted. After the battle, she calls our names. Suddenly, she's not Sorceress Adir anymore. She's Adir Kramer, our matron. She praises us, but is also greatly concerned about whether she was able to save alone. But before anything else, Renoa goes over to the fallen Cypher and kisses him, seemingly reviving him, but then she collapses. No one knows exactly what's happened, and it's in this state of total confusion where Disc 2 comes to an end. Before going anywhere else, let's look at Disc 2 some more. I was a bit worried going in after the end of Disc 1 and how silly things got at the end of that, but you know what? Disc 2 actually comes together really freaking well. For all the flaws there are in the orphanage scene, it is the part of the game where the motivations do come together, and most of the reveals are perfectly fine with the exception of Irvine being the one to do it, and those bloody GFs. In any case, it's followed by what, aside from a couple of little bits, might be the best sequence in the whole game. The Battle of the Gardens is an absolute showstopper. The FMVs are outrageous, as are the action scenes. Yeah, it's stupid for Renoa to be taken out like that. It's also annoying for all the other party members to act like dicks and shout about her to Squall when not only does he have to think of everyone as leader, but they could easily rescue her themselves and indeed probably should. And it's silly pacing for Renoa and Squall to have a big old heart to heart while the battle's all around them. But still, there's those frickin' rocket bikes jumping onto Balaam Garden. And when there's that, you can forgive anything. This game is worth playing for a good few reasons, but the Battle of the Gardens is right up there, a grand moment. Perhaps there's another reason why Disc 2 is generally very good. Weirdly, in many ways it feels like it could be an ending, and that Disc 1 and 2 could easily be their own game. For most of that time we've chased a deer, we've had the big moment when we realised who she was, and then in the end we freed her, although sadly it appears that one of us died in the conflict. Seriously, Final Fantasy VIII could end here. A fair few people would probably say that it should have ended here. But obviously, there are still two more discs. They aren't filled with bonus content. We're just getting started, aren't we? <laughs> now, there's more I could start analysing right now, particularly characters as a lot has changed, especially with Squall and Renoa, but we're kind of in the middle of all of that, so it can wait a bit. For now, let's get on with the story. Back in Garden, Renoa is in a coma. No one can figure out what's happened to her at all. Squall is very upset about this, but is trying not to show it and remain a leader. And as for Adir? Well, she's back at the orphanage. The only thing we can do at the moment is go there, talk to her, and find out just what on earth happened. How come she's no longer our enemy? The orphanage? Well, it's seen better days. For better or worse, Sid shows up. After making Squall a leader, he basically disappeared, even though his presence would have undoubtedly helped matters. It goes to show that in the end, well, he's just a coward. Adia reveals to us the truth, that she allowed herself to be possessed by another, altogether more powerful sorceress named Ultimisha, who comes from the future. She did this in order to protect Elone, who Ultimisha desires to obtain in order to complete her plan to compress the world's timeline and bring herself fully to our present. Whenever we faced Adia in the past, we weren't facing her, we were facing Ultimisha in her form. The importance of a loan presumably comes from her special ability to take people back to the past. Again, the subject of Esfar and the Sorceress War comes up. No one knows what happened to Esfar or its leader, Sorceress Adele, but Adia believes that while she could possibly be possessed again by Ultimisha at any time, the future Sorceress is now attempting to join herself with Adele, who Adia believes to be still alive. Adele, unlike Adia, is apparently almost wholly evil. If Adele and Ultimisha come together, well, that's when shit will most certainly hit the fan. So, um, yeah, that's a lot to take in, pretty quickly. This is the first time that we know the identity of our true antagonist, and she kinda comes from nothing. The same is said of the notion of time compression and how that affects our story. It helps if you know a little bit about sorceress lore. Generally, the rule in FF8's world is that a sorceress cannot die until they have passed their skills, essentially their soul, onto someone else, which is why Adir believes that Adele is still around. There's also the reasons for the time compression which currently come across as mumbo jumbo. Essentially it boils down to this. Ultimisha wants to shorten the timeline in order to create a world where she is the only sorceress who can exist, consuming all others to create an all-powerful entity that no normal force could hope to match. 
As a sorceress, she can exercise a degree of mind control on regular people, from Deelin's populace to Cypher, but she can only completely possess other sorceresses, most likely one at a time. That's about all we can deduce for now with what we've got. Adia knows little else and does not know what happened to Inoa, perhaps unsurprising seeing as she doesn't know her at all in the first place. Squall finds it hard to control his emotions right now, and all he can do is go back to the infirmary to watch over Inoa's body, something that the game doesn't fully make clear but should be easy enough to grasp from the hints. Squall is desperate for Inoa to give him a sign. While he is still uneasy about showing his emotions to other people, it's so clear how much he feels for her. And once again, Squall collapses. We're back with Laguna for our fourth flashback. This flashback is short, and on the surface is more comedic. It's a look at Laguna and Kios's time in Trabia filming a movie. You can get a hint about this earlier on if you've been picking up the Timber Maniacs magazines from around the world. Laguna did end up becoming a journalist after all, and he wrote about his travelling experiences in said mag. When you find them, Selfie records the contents of each mag in her diary, which you can access in the computer in the classroom. The one that you may well have not looked at since the very start of the game, in other words. It is useful though, as it does provide some much needed colour. Anyway, Laguna is shooting a film about a sorceress and a knight, and is tasked with defending the sorceress from a dragon who should be played by Kiros. Unfortunately, it turns out to be a very real dragon who we have to beat, primarily in another rubbish timing-based fighting minigame. The flashback ends just as Laguna spots a red light in the distance. Now this is all very comedic, but there's a big and subtle hint here. When Laguna wields a gunblade and assumes a stance with it, it is the exact same stance that Cypher takes with a gunblade. The movie that they were shooting is the same movie that Cypher saw when he was a child, the one that inspired his ambition to be the knight protecting a sorceress, essentially the movie that made him. Another very intriguing connection indeed. Speaking of connection, the main reason for the existence of this flashback is so that alone can speak to Squall. That mind link is still there, and it's the only way that alone can reach him. Squall? Well, he's changed. A lot. In truth, the time compression, Ultimisha, sorceresses, all of that stuff, doesn't really interest him. The situation with Rinoa has brought his one true motivation to the forefront. He cares about little else except Rinoa being okay and coming back. There's a few callbacks in this whole situation. Squall's reaction is reminiscent of how he was when everyone thought that Cypher had been executed. There's direct references. At one point, Squall comments about how talking to Rinoa is like talking to a wall. The exact thing he was when Christus was expressing her feelings to him way back at the graduation. The shoe's on the other foot now. Squall asks alone to let him into Rinoa's immediate past so that things can be changed, but it's hopeless. You can't actually change the past. And besides, Alone can't do that, she doesn't know her. Even so, Squall's one plan is to somehow find Alone and bring Rinoa to her, so that somehow she can use her powers to bring her back. Somehow being the key word here. Even with the world in peril from some unknown, potentially catastrophic force, it's nothing in Squall's mind compared to Rinoa. Even when Adir was explaining how disastrous the arrival of Ultimisha would be for the world, Rinoa was the only thing on his mind to the point where he literally had to be snapped out of his reverie. That might be a shock, perhaps even outrageous motivation for some, especially for someone who is supposed to be the hero of this piece. But then let me ask you this, how heroic in actuality is Squall Leonhardt? How heroic is he supposed to be? I'm not going to analyse that yet. It's merely something to ponder as the next chapters play out. Now, the last time we saw Alone was when she was taken from Balaam by a white ship, won by a group calling themselves Adir's Seed. Presently, said ship is our only lead. Adir knows little about it, but believes it to be stationed somewhere on the central continent and has written up a letter that hopefully should convince them to help us. That's all we know. You've got to look for said ship yourself. This can be a pain, but it's not all that far from where we are. As long as you search slowly and methodically, it hopefully won't take that long to find. At least it didn't take me that long. I have heard horror stories. Naturally, the folks on the ship take a fair bit of convincing. Initially, they will refuse to tell you anything about it alone whatsoever. Before offering the letter to the leader, you can walk around a bit. You can find out just who these people are. They are Adir's seats, as in her children. 
It wasn't just our party and no one else at the orphanage, and Matron cared for these orphans too. Before being possessed by Ultimisha, Adir was the captain of this ship. But when she knew that she was about to be taken, she made plans to protect alone by sending her to Garden before leaving the ship altogether. We also run into two people we've not seen in ages, Zone and Watts, aka the other members of the Timber Resistance. The Galbadians went after them following that disastrous mission, but they escaped and wound up being taken in here. All is cheery at first, until the subject of Renoa comes up. We promised to protect her, and now she's in a coma. Zone, who we've mostly seen getting stomach cramps and rushing to the bathroom, is now calling Squall a son of a bitch and threatening to knock him out. A jarring character shift? No. More of a sign of just how much shit has changed, really. Things have gotten way serious since Timber. Finally, we meet with the leader, give him Adir's letter, and convince him to tell us the story. And as you might have expected by now, Alone isn't here anymore. The Galbadians did manage to find the ship in the end and gave chase, ultimately trapping them here, until something odd happened. A Nesfar ship appeared and started fighting the Galbadians. Now keep in mind that no one has seen an Esfar ship or Esfar soldiers for 17 years. At first they try to convince the Seeds to abandon ship, but naturally they refuse. However, Alone comes out, sees who they are, and decides to go with them, literally running and jumping onto their ship. At which point, the Esfar ship retreated. And so, Alone's in Esfar, the big eastern continent we haven't been to yet. Indeed, we haven't been able to go there. The entire continent is blocked off by a huge mountain range, meaning that there's no way for Garden to make landfall. We need shores for that. Looking at the map, you might think that Latrabia and Esfar continents are connected, and we could get in that way. However, the obvious path is blocked by a huge crater. Said crater is indirectly important to the game's lore, although not for reasons that would make sense currently. Even when we get to these reasons, it might be a bit of a reach. <laughs> There is only one way into the continent, and it's at Fisherman's Horizon, a long disused railway that stretches out over the ocean from Esfar to Galbadia, only accessible to us at Fisherman's Horizon. By the way, in case you don't know, Fisherman's Horizon is populated by a lot of former Esfar mechanics. It's insinuated that the mechanics left Esfar, but the scientists stayed behind. Now before we go there, it should be noted that there's some big plot development in Deelin City, and like a lot of FF8 fins, it's the sort of plot development you may well never see because there is no reason to go to Deelin right now, nor is there anything new to do there. However, what's changed? Well, Adir isn't their leader anymore, don't forget that. Instead, Cypher is. It appears that he is still taking orders from a sorceress, and there's only really one that it can be. The Galbadians are as militaristic as ever under Cypher's command, and have apparently just dredged up some huge Esfar made obelisk from the ocean that, well, no one knows what it does actually, but it's kind of worrying in any case. Worrying is a key word actually. Cypher cannot, after all, influence the minds of a populace in a way that a sorceress can. The people of Dielin are concerned about the actions of their new leader, and are wondering why there can't just be peace. It seems that they've recovered from being brainwashed. Anyway, short of going to Shumi and drawing some more Ultima, or taking part in various other somewhat minor side quests, there is little to do except go east. Obviously there are no trains running between Fisherman's Horizon and Esfar, so there's only one thing that Squall can really do. He puts Renoa on his back, leaves the garden parked, and starts walking. A walk that is, presumably, a pretty frickin' long way. This walk seems completely ridiculous at first, but it should be noted that if you've been keeping up with your Timber Maniacs mags, you'll know that Laguna actually travelled to Esfar in the exact same way. The poetic nature of Squall following in Laguna's footsteps justifies the scene well enough. As Squall walks, he talks to Inoa. Sure, she's unconscious, but this at least allows Squall to talk to someone without his usual inhibitions. It's quite an affecting chat, really. Squall details his faults and how he is, how he purposefully pulls his guard up around people so that no one wants to get close to him as a way of protecting himself from being hurt through losing those people. That's what happened with Alone, and it's affected Squall ever since. With Renoa though, things are different. Slowly but surely, Squall is changing because of that. It's a far cry from when they first met. Each question that Squall throws to Inoa isn't so much knowingly rhetorical, but delivered with the slight hope that she'll answer. It's quite a powerful moment. 
Honestly, for me, this is the moment that pretty much cemented how great a character Squall actually is. The arc that he goes on and how he develops is refreshingly different from a lot of RPG protags all the way through. And again, there's still that question. How good is Squall meant to be, in truth? He is still a mercenary. Is he the best leader around? Well, no, but he's not supposed to be. People often complain about Sid choosing him to be the leader, but in truth there wasn't anyone else who could do it. Sid is a coward, so he's not going to take the lead now that war is afoot. The other potential candidates would have been Christus, Xu, or Dr. Kadawaki. Xu and Kadawaki have important roles already. Christus is the only one who we've seen in battle, but we've seen just how awful a leader she is. If Zell had taken the lead, well, the game would probably be over by now. Maybe selfie? <laughs> Could be cool if you wanted every city in the world destroyed by trains covered in glitter and packed with nuclear weapons, I suppose, but as awesome as she is, she's not really a leader either. And you know what I think about our resident stupid fucking cowboy already. So yeah, Squall is kind of the default choice. He's not supposed to be a perfect leader, far from it. It doesn't come naturally to him, and while he has gotten better at it, he's never going to be a great leader. And a big part of that is because in the end, despite his perceived coldness, he is purely motivated by people. Think about it. How many times have you heard Squall say that he's doing something for the good of the planet? He's certainly not doing this for the planet, or to stop a sorceress. It all comes back to FF8 at its core being an intimate story centering around two people. It can be very ridiculous a lot of the time, but that is a constant. Winoa has had her own progression too and is nowhere near as bad a character now as she initially appeared to be, but we'll get to that. And of course there are those horse sailor actually, Squall isn't here at all, and we'll get to that too. Anyway, one thing does slightly blot this scene's copybook. At the end, right as Squall finally reaches the Esfar continent, guess who's there? Yep, everybody else. They all came along too, which is obviously fine, but what's annoying is that they got here first. How did they do that, when there's seemingly no other way to make it here aside from walking the track? Snatch a handcart while we were snoozing? <laughs> it's a logical irritance, and the weird thing about FF8 is that the minor logical irritances are somehow far more annoying than the massive ones. Maybe it has something to do with the person they're riding with, mind. Adia is now with us. She wants to come in order to pay a visit to someone named Dr. Odin. You might recall that name from way back in Disc 1. He was the guy who manufactured a necklace that could suppress a sorceress's powers, a prototype of which Renoa was going to use in her ill-thought-out plan to stop the Len-possessed Adia. Adia is well aware that Ultimisha could repossess her at any time. She's with us because she hopes that the Doctor can somehow stop this from happening. She's also with us because, well, if Ultimisha does take her form again, then she's with the people who are the most capable of stopping that, no matter what the cost. This also means that for the time being, Adia is a selectable party member, one who's pretty good with magic as you would expect. Obviously we use her as it's nice to freshen up the party a bit, I mean most of the time I usually just go with Winoa and Selfie, Selfie is the one absolute constant because her banter's great and her character's awesome, Zell often gets a look into if I want some stupidity, Quistis doesn't get used all that much but is certainly there if Winoa or Selfie aren't available, and Irvine never gets selected and is perfectly free to fuck off and die any time he likes because he's the worst character in the entire history of Final Fantasy games. Our next destination is over a dried out lake that, my goodness, is a beautiful destination. It's places like this that make me love the old pre-rendered graphics so much. The arid salt flats are truly desolate, a sign of the hard journey you've got to take. And there's an undead boss monster, which provides a cool opportunity for a deer, who's just joined us, to hit the damage cap by chucking an X-potion in its direction. Finally, we can go no further. The salt stretches out as far as the eyes can see, with no noticeable path through. Weirdly, however, there's a lot of static about. Even the odd symbol. Are we in front of a barrier? Suddenly, in what is far from the craziest thing to happen on this disc, a hole opens up in the middle of the air and we can climb towards it via an invisible ladder. It's a fantastic, sudden shift. We move from the salt flats into a small scientific space, until finally we hit an elevator. On the long journey up, the party muses on how there's no turning back now. And indeed, there quite literally isn't. There's certainly no way that we can decide that actually we want to go all the way back to Garden and complete the Card Club side quest instead. We're stuck on this elevator, taking us up to something that we do not know. For all we know, it's about to take us to the middle of a blast furnace. Finally, however, it stops. 
and a window on the world opens. In a game filled with pretty excellent graphics and FMV sequences, especially for 1999, there is perhaps none that's as truly stunning as the S-File reveal. All of a sudden you're greeted with this huge cityscape, something that covers a massive chunk of the continent. The biggest city we've seen up to this point is Deelin, and Esfar makes it look like a deer's orphanage. A platform speeds us through the city at a quite staggering pace, and we get to see the architecture. It's like a finished SimCity 2000 project that someone took four years to perfect. You can tell from the buildings and the general planning just how science-oriented the city is too. It's advanced to a level far beyond anything else we've ever seen. If this was still Final Fantasy VII and we were worried about the consumption of Mako, <laughs> then good lord, this shit looks like it would have sucked up the entire livestream within a year. s is big, is what I'm trying to say. It's also, as we'll soon see, quite a challenge to actually get around. Of course, there are more immediate matters. s doesn't get a lot of tourists by virtue of being hidden from view for 17 years, and we have no idea whether we're about to get a welcoming committee or a bullet to the head. It doesn't feel like an oppressive city controlled by an evil mastermind, but then you just don't know, do you? Either way, this feels like quite the inopportune moment to have a flashback. Which of course is what happens. Squall and Selfie go into dream time, while Adia stands around and probably wonders what the hell just happened and why no one had told her that the party was narcoleptic. So, this is the fifth and final Laguna flashback. In case you're keeping track, this is the current Laguna timeline as we know it. We joined Laguna and his crew, Kiros and Ward, in Deelin City where they were on leave during the Sorceress War. While there, Laguna had a brief romance with Julia Hartley, Renoa's mother and later a famous sinner, who sadly died in a car crash when Renoa was aged about five. In the second flashback, we found the crew at an excavation site where Esfar were uncovering some huge crystal-based structure. Ultimately, Esfar ambushed them on a cliffside and they all had to jump off. Laguna spent the next few months recovering in Windhill under the care of Wayne, while also caring for Wayne's adopted daughter, Elone. That's what we can fit together. Before this flashback, we also know that he ended up filming a movie in Trabia, and that he was cared for in Shumi Village, where they look up to him as something of an icon. We also know that he was on his way to Esfar, and you can probably figure out why he was going there. Anyway, Laguna and his crew, Ward has since rejoined us having left his job at the prison, although he is now mute thanks to the cliff fall, have been captured, and are being set to work for Dr. Odin. So it seems that he's not a nice guy. The guards can be kind of arsey too, especially if you talk or not do any work. However, we do get a chance to break out which... well, shit. The logic bombs are flying. Why did Laguna have his gun all that time? Now. I know the understandable answer to that. Nobody wants to animate a whole different set of attacks and animations for this single battle against a no-mark soldier who you're going to kill in one hit. Especially not in 3D, it'd take ages. It was easier for people to switch their weapons in the older Final Fantasies and so they often did. I get that. There could probably have been a better solution, mind you. Anyway, we all come back together and we can break out. Thankfully this isn't another D-District prison, in fact this place is literally a couple of screens. The next one gives us our first proper glimpse of Dr. Odin and... Um... What the hell is this? Why does he have a massive Lord Percy-esque Tudor collar? Why does he talk with a German accent? What is this? Dr. Odin is weird, one of the characters in the game that really turn people off. He's sort of like Sid as it goes, which is appropriate considering how heavily Sid was influenced by Odin's work. Dr. Odin is in fact the person who came up with the idea of using Guardian forces in the first place. More than that, he's responsible for the use of magic in general, or power magic as it's called, which we use in conjunction with GFs at the cost of our long-term memory. Others, like say G-soldiers, do use power magic as well, but they tend to have it as part of a weapon, whereas sorceresses and monsters just use magic naturally. Odin is a brilliant scientist, to be sure, although he is also one that lacks morals and has no qualms with experimenting on people. Combine this with his obvious heavy German accent and… yeah, you get the idea. It's a rather disturbing connotation, which then somewhat jibes with Odin being mostly used as comedic relief. Anyway, it seems as though Odin's tiring of his recent project, which just so which just so happens to be a giant obelisk house in a crystal. We've been hearing a fair bit about this and we finally have a name for it at last, the Lunatic Pandora. 
Anyway, he's moved on to a girl he's observing and clearly has some special powers. As you might have guessed, said girl is the whole reason that Laguna and company are here. After chasing Odin around, we find out where she is and go rescue her. The building resistance in Esfar who are tired of the war and of their current leader's dictatorship, Sorceress Adele, decide to flock around the charismatic screw-up Laguna as their new boss, the man who can lead them to eventually overthrowing Adele for good. And finally, Alona and Laguna share a quick and tender scene where they're reunited at last. Now we know of course that this didn't last, but it's a good way to end this flashback. And yes, this is the last playable Laguna section. We'll find out why soon enough, of course. The Laguna story is again one of the really good things about FF8. He's such a fun character, and it's amusing to see the big similarities between himself and Squall. Laguna displays a lot of Squall's flaws in a more comedic way. He actually does struggle to get close to people, but instead of purposefully shunning away from them, he'll fake a limp instead. It's like someone playing a parody version of Squall in old comic theatre. He does have some tender moments though, and as a leader he clearly motivates people, really does attract them. It may seem at times like he fails upwards into prominence, but that's because he just takes chances now without thinking about the odds. These are characteristics that Squall could have, but he chooses not to believe in them, or outright suppress them a lot of the time. The other interesting thing is how Squall's own relationship with Laguna evolves. At first he dismisses him as a complete moron. Even as late as Shumi, he still thinks that he's something of an idiot. Funnily enough, his thoughts on Laguna seem to change once Rinoa goes into her coma, as if it's making sense for him too, and a lot of Laguna's words come back to him. He feels closer to Laguna as time goes on, especially now. And so, we wake up from the flashback. We are now in Esfar, good and proper, and we are set to be taken to the Presidential Palace to meet Dr. Odin. An odd place to meet a guy who is actually not the President, but hey ho. Before that however, it should be said that believe it or not, we are actually getting very close to the end game. All the main pieces are slowly falling into place, and not long after this, things are about to get extreme. They might even be about to get ridiculous. There's a pretty large chance that the game's plot could go to a level beyond anyone's wildest imagination. There's going to be an absolute shit ton of stuff to cover in other words, and after this point there's no real way of stopping, we're just going to have to tear through it. And so the third part will end here. Will the fourth part be enough to end this saga? Currently, I don't even know. We'll just have to see on that front. Bye for now. Woohoo, we're back. Right, before we properly get on with things, let's have a little bit of analysis. I've been promising a bunch for Inoa for a while now as it goes, and I've still not gotten around to it. Like Squall, she's actually quite a bit better than people often make out for me, although there are some frustrating things there still. As we know already, she doesn't start out the best. She used to act like a spoiled little rich girl and used to call people meanies, which was quite irritating. Now the one thing that helps with that is if you understand that Rinoa, like everyone else, is 17 years old. There really is virtually no age variance in Final Fantasy's party. Everyone is the same age, more or less. Quistis is one year older at 18, and that's it. Cypher is also the same age as us. Certainly is a young adult story, that's for sure. Thing is, Rinoa and Squall do leave terrible first impressions, especially as they bicker with each other through the whole of Disc 1. But things do gradually change. I often end up taking Rinoa with me on missions because she's different to the rest of the party, something that she openly admits to back in that orphanage scene. She isn't afraid to be forthcoming about her feelings, which marks her as different from the rest, not just Squall really. Everyone in our party has their own way of concealing their feelings. Selfie's cheerful, Zell is brash, Irvine has over-exaggerated machismo, and Quistis is more professional and sometimes flirty. Rinoa doesn't have that which makes her different and honestly a bit refreshing. As I said before, she kind of represents the future and someone who makes the best out of what she has. Even if she isn't quite as single-minded in battle as everybody else in the party is, she's more well-rounded, warts and all. It makes her a good companion for Squall at any rate. Has she proved herself in the party? Well, definitely. She did that when she got that idiot cowboy to turn back and actually help us out. To be honest, she's not a terrible character at all. There's lots worse in the game than Renoa, believe me. The annoying thing about Renoa is less to do with her as a character and more how the plot uses her. It seems that Renoa always ends up sidelined in big situations through no fault of her own. 
I wish that the game did more with her at times as opposed to just having her stand on that one bit of ground that so happens to break off. Even when she collapses it appears that she was just the closest person in the vicinity. These things don't make her a bad character, just that the plot kind of screws her often. And of course there's another big old fan theory, the second biggest after Squall is dead in fact. But honestly, I can't go into much detail with that right now. But I will. There are other issues worth addressing. One other annoying thing about FF8 is that honestly, not a lot of the other characters have that much to do. There are considerable pacing issues with the story in FF8 which often make it appear to be a hodgepodge of scenes that were pasted together by a plot after the fact. Take poor old Quistis for example, she has had virtually nothing to contribute to the plot since her failure in dealing. Zell gets crumbs here and there, he's had naps since we were last at Balin, frankly. The cowboy's plot is as follows, struggle to shoot a deer, then be forced to go back to the prison by Renoa, and aside from dumping a load of exposition on us that's literally it for the whole game. Selfie's had some character development but I fear even that's running out. It's kind of annoying. A lot of F8's character development is front loaded in this way and you wish that it was spaced out a bit more so that the supporting characters in your party felt more important and not like they were just there. Right, anyway, s -file. Fortunately for continuation, we start off with Adia finishing up explaining the current situation to the presidential aide at the palace. In short, Adia wants Odin to fix her, which he says shouldn't be a problem. Squall wants to see her alone, which is agreed to after a bit of simple threatening, and the proviso that Odin simply observes Rinoa for a bit. The change in Squall is very notable. With Rinoa in such a vulnerable state, he's actually become quite possessive and can't help but threaten anyone who comes into contact with her. This is not a positive characteristic to develop. Again, Squall's status as a hero is purposefully shaky. He works a lot better if you try not to pigeonhole him into the traditional protagonist's role. Finally though, we're told to go to the Lunar Gate, where we'll be able to meet alone. In the meantime, we should explore the city. And my goodness, again it can't be stressed what a site it is, particularly because it's so different from the mostly European architecture that we've seen everywhere else. While you can just advance the plot, it's worth looking around to get familiar with its layout. It's an outer inn, complete with walkways that make getting around quicker, and skyways if you just want to say screw it and go to where you want to. It also feels quite busy indeed, there's always something about. As far as layout goes it can be maddening and it is very easy to get lost. It's worth a bit of knowledge though, because it will be important later on. We can also find out some facts. For all the futuristic trappings, Esfar is a democracy and a rather easy going one, with both residents and guards happily willing to chat to you even if they've not actually had that many visitors. Hell the president apparently isn't even around all that much. Wonder who he could be? Anyway, the Lunar Gate is outside of the city and it's highly recommended that you rent a car to get around the highways, stressing again how big Esfar is. Hiring cars is something I've barely mentioned because I just don't do it much, but it's one thing you can spend money on at least, that and the fuel for the journey. It's good if you want a nice stress free journey around the map, but honestly, I don't find them to be that useful until right now. Chocobos are also in the game too, you get those through solving these really annoying puzzles in little dome shaped forests dotted around the map, they're good for a one time use and they can move over shallow water. That is basically it for them, aside from one other unique part of the game that I will get to later on. As it turns out, Alone is waiting for us in space. We're using the Lunar Gate to get up there. Yes, Esfar Alone have mastered space travel in this world, and they do it using a huge curved gun that will shoot us up there in minutes and somehow not totally splatter us. Squall's going up there along with Selfie and naturally Renoa. The rest of us are stuck twiddling our thumbs down here, but then Renoa's dog Angelo alerts us to some quite big happenings outside. Now as we know already, Galbadia has the lunatic Pandora, it's this huge obelisk that houses a crystal and it can be moved around. At present, it's heading straight for Esfar. It's a pretty intimidating sight as you can probably imagine. Now you might be asking what exactly this fin does. Well to explain, I'm going to need to go into more storyline explanations of gameplay, which this game does a lot and is often quite fun. In this instance, it's how the game handles monsters. Apparently the reason why FF8's planet is filled with monsters is because they fall down from the moon. I'm sure there's lots of spluttering going on already about gravitational pull and so forth, but look, you're just going to have to accept this, alright? That's why there are monsters. Just as pollution in FF7 makes monsters, the moon makes FF8s. I don't know why. 
One of the big disasters that tends to face the universe in FF8 is something called a lunar quiet. This happens when a large group of monsters are brought together on the moon and they drop down as one to Earth, essentially in the form of a teardrop, hence the name. One big lunar cry a hundred or so years ago was enough to wipe out the Centra, which is why their continent is nothing but ruins. And we've actually semi-seen a lunar cry in the game already. The flashback where Laguna was filming a movie that got interrupted by a dragon ended with Laguna spotting a red light in the distance. That was caused by Esfar during Adele's reign, inducing a lunar cry with the help of lunatic Pandora. The crystal pillar housed within it dropped from the moon during the cry that killed the Centra, and is capable of inducing a cry when it is aligned with the moon. You know that crater that stopped us from taking the garden into the Esfar continent? That was where the Lunar Choir made its last landfall. Chances are most of the monsters we've been fighting come from that, or they're hardier and have been around since the Sentra days. Anyway, Esfar decided to do away with it after Adele's reign came to an end, and there's literally only one thing it's good for. So you know exactly what Galbadia want to do with it. Have you swallowed all of that lore? Good, because you'll need to. It's going to get more extreme than that, believe me. Anyway, the Pandora's arrival is obviously not good news, and Squall isn't here to just, you know, be competent. And so Zell takes his big chance to lead the party. Dr. Odin lays out a plan for us. The target for the Pandora is not Esfar, but something called Tears Point, constructed when Adele plans to use the obelisk as a weapon. Once the Pandora lands there, then the Lunar Choir will be triggered, and yeah, that's bad. There are three points in the city where it's possible for us to enter the Pandora as it passes over us. Whichever one we make it to, we've got to do it in time. This is why it's a good idea to familiarise yourself with the city, although it's not that hard to find where you need to go, especially if you've got ink none. Shit's already hitting the fan, soldiers are milling around, and the atmosphere in Esfar is changing. Zell impatiently takes all of this in. He just wants to get in the Pandora and start punching things, because this is his big moment to be the hero. We make it to one of the pickup points, beat up on a couple of soldiers and find our way in. Zell, Quistis and Adir. It's the big shot, the do or die moment. We make our way further in and then… a robot ambushes us. We don't get the chance to even fight it. It grabs us and hurls us down a trapdoor. The Pandora quite literally spat us out and all we can do is watch as it leaves the city and heads for Tears Point. The mission was a failure. This whole thing is quite a big and, needless to say, rather down a moment for Zell, who has something of an interesting character arc because, well, it's purposefully quite static. He's a broken character. He is actually quite smart, but he's never able to control his emotions to the point where he usually blurts out the utterly worn thing at the worst time. He doesn't have any patience. That's where he starts and it's kind of where he stays. Such characters often tend to have that big moment where they grow up and this is kind of presented as that taking the reins moment for Zell, but alas he falls short again. He's screwed up one more time. He just doesn't get any luck. At the same time all of this is happening, our other group have completed their journey into space, or to be accurate, a space station. The aim for Squall remains the same, fix Rinoa with the help of Elone. Anyone who tries to interfere may well get a gun blade to the gut if they aren't careful. Seriously, he's majorly het up. We get to have a look around, for example, we can see where they're keeping Sorceress Adele. Yeah, that sorceress who could cause such a disaster if she's released is right there. Now you may be outraged immediately, but it does make sense. Remember, a sorceress cannot actually be fully killed. They can lose their power in times of crisis, but it must pass on to somebody else. Adele is not dead, she's sealed. And if you've got to seal her, it's probably best to at least keep an eye on her. I mean, the president himself is out there supervising things, so clearly nothing bad at all is going to happen. We can also look on the surface of the moon, where monsters are starting to come together. It seems that regardless of what the Pandora does, the world is due a lunar cry fairly soon. We've obviously been killing enough monsters to warrant it. Finally though, Squall manages to meet with Alone. What can she do? Well, she can… not do a whole lot really. It's not quite managed to get through Squall's head. Elone can take people back to the past, but the past cannot be changed. In the end, there's no way you can change what happened. Elone thought that maybe she could through Squall, but it was no good. Is there anything at all that can be done? Could at least a presence be felt? That might be, but it's kind of shaky and a long shot. And even still, Elone doesn't know Renoa, so what can she do? This plan was kind of flawed right from the start, but even so, Squall had to at least give it a go, because there wasn't any other option. And then, well, things start to go on. 
All of a sudden, there's an emergency in the medical bay where Renoa is being kept. What is said emergency? Well, the good news is that Renoa is up and out of bed. The bad news is that she's slowly swaying around, clearly not herself, and anyone who gets close to her tends to get force-pushed at speed towards the nearest wall, even Squall himself when he tries to get close. There's nothing we can do to stop what happens, nothing anyone can do. First, Renoa unlocks the first seal to Adele's tomb. Then she moves on, dons a spacesuit, goes outside just as the doors shut, and unlocks the second. And at the same time as all this is happening, the Lunar Choir is triggered due to the events that happen back on the ground. A huge ray of nothing but monsters is streamed down, and Adele, with a smile, goes down with it. Now I'm sure that you can look at the science here and start screaming about how none of this makes any sense, and I'm sure it doesn't. But look, you're going to have to keep moving. I know the game's getting very extreme and quite silly indeed, but we're right in the middle of this, and you just can't apply proper logic to these things. In the end, Alone was pretty much a total red herring. The issue was always with Noah herself, and what's seemingly inside of her. Elone was more like an unsuspecting treat, bringing us closer, and bringing Renoa closer. Is that a good plan? Well, it certainly relies on a lot of luck on the part of whoever did the possession. What if Elone wasn't in space? But why was she in space anyway? What if she was not right there of all the places in the world where she could have been? Anyway, that'll become clear. For now, we must evacuate. This station's gonna blow. The President himself tells us to take care of Elone before being whisked away, and we must do the same. As for Renoa, well, she'll float out there in space until her oxygen runs out, and then she'll die. Whatever possessed Renoa no longer has any need for her. Instead, they possessed Adele as soon as the second seal was broken. Obviously, that's not good enough for Squall. While we're escaping, he works with Elone to access anything that she possibly can. She can, at the very least, connect Squall telepathically to Renoa as she floats. We see a couple of events from the past. We even see Irvine trying to take Renoa back to her dad, or Renoa requesting that Zell borrow Squall's ring so she can have one just like it. And finally we do get to see the big moment, what happened when she collapsed. She passed a message to Cypher right there when whatever was in Adir passed into her, that told him she would be his new sorceress, that it wasn't over, and now she floats there, left to die. But in that moment, while Renoa is essentially flashing back her whole life, Squall is able to keep her going, to help her to turn on the emergency support and give herself a few minutes longer. In a quite creepy scene, we see Renoa floating, 2001-esque, in space, back to being herself but running out of air fast, until that message comes. And at this point, Squall, having donned a spacesuit himself when he was hoping to stop Renoa from releasing the second Adele seal, will go out there with her because there's not really any other place this can go. It's all about Renoa. Finally, the pair of them do float together in space. What now though? Both of their supplies will run out, and then they'll both die. But then all of a sudden there's something of a miracle, or something very convenient. A ship, that we can enter. There doesn't seem to be much on it, but there is air. Once Renoa and Squall find a way in, they can breathe again. <laughs> the day has been saved. Phew! Once we're out of the spacesuits, Renoa wants a big ol' hug from the hero who's just saved her. Squall is a bit more pragmatic. Sure, we can breathe again, but we are still lost in space, and we kind of need to find a way to get control of this fin, or at least establish communication with the ground. Plus, there's more monsters filing about, waiting to be killed. Again, one of those little dungeon puzzles that actually do come at a decent time, seeing as we've had little but story and cutscene for the past 30 minutes or more. Basically, you kill these propagators in pairs according to their colour, otherwise they revive. Once you've done that, you can get into the cockpit properly and establish contacts with the ground. Apparently we're on a ship called the Ragnarok that Esfar lost contact with years ago. The monsters that were roaming the ship had something to do with that according to the logs. Ground Control will have little trouble bringing us in, but in the meantime, Squall and Renoa have some alone time together. And after what is quite frankly a hell of a lot of exposition and convenience, there does come a moment where it's all a little worth it. Yep, it's the eyes on me moment, the one where Squall and Renoa do have a proper heart to heart as the game's main theme plays. Kinda corny? Maybe. But even through all the ridiculous events, it nicely brings Finns back to just these two people. Now look, I'm a sucker for a good love story, and no matter what, Final Fantasy VIII is a good love story. The eyes on me scene is very touching, with Renoa trying to hold on to Squall for as long as she can. The past and the future aren't what's important, she just wants to be there, in the present, with him. That's important. 
It becomes especially important when the folks on the ground ask us who's actually on the ship. When we answer, there's a shock when they find out Rinoa is the other person aside from Squall, or Sorceress Rinoa as they call her. And yeah, that's not bollocks. Rinoa is now a sorceress. As I said just now, in a time of great crisis, a sorceress can lose her powers and they can be passed on. That's what happened to Adir and Ultimecia in Galbadia Garden. You do not have to be born a sorceress to become one. And so that's how Rinoa became a sorceress, and indeed how she came to be possessed by Ultimecia. Estar, as you might have guessed, do not like sorceresses, and as soon as the Ragnarok touches down, Rinoa is to be taken away to their sorceress memorial for immediate stasis forever. This in the end is why Rinoa wanted to stay right here. She doesn't exactly want to be a sorceress either, and she knows that this is the end for her and Squall. And so when we touch down, that's what happens. Rinoa goes quietly and Squall, well there's not much he can do, at least that's what he thinks. It's something of a downbeat situation for everyone involved, just as Rinoa and Squall were basically on the verge of declaring their undying love for each other. In the end, he is left to mill about Laragnarok alone. Until Selfie shows up anyways, followed by Quistis, Zell, and Irvine. They made it here because, you know, of course they did. After everything's been explained, Quistis has her first important plot moment for two discs. She gives Squall a right dressing down and asks him exactly what the hell he's doing and why on earth he's let Rinoa get taken away like that. Sure, the group have done the Rinoa thing a hell of a lot to annoy an effect at the garden when they screwed up, but here? Well, it's important. After all the heavy stuff that's just happened, it snaps Squall back into focus. Obviously, we're not going to let Rinoa get sealed up forever. We're going to break her out soon as we actually figure out how to fly this fin. But what do you know, Selfie gets it working just fine, apparently it's dead simple. This is a JRPG after all, anyone can suddenly turn out to be a pilot, especially if they're a young teenage girl. This of course means that we can now fly around the map in a big old airship, the Ragnarok is ours for keeps. But first, jeez, we definitely need to break down all of the shit that just happened. This is definitely, at the very least, the start of the point where, for a lot of people, Final Fantasy VIII goes completely and irreversibly off the rails. Believe it or not, it's only going to get more ridiculous from here. And yes, I do see a lot of the problems. There's issues with the whole Lunar Cry thing, and how even in the world of JRPGs it completely stretches believability and the extremities of lunar physics, and there's issues with whatever plan Ultimecia had. Assuming that she was the reason why Rinoa was comatose all of this time, how was making her comatose the best way of going about it? Doesn't that totally leave everything to chance? What if they never found alone? What if she wasn't in space? What if, what if, what if, uh, there's just so many things. What if the Ragnarok wasn't just floating there either? Seriously, that comes off like the Hitchhiker's Guide, when Arthur and Ford managed to get on a Vogon ship despite the destruction of the Earth. To me, <laughs> yeah, this might just be the silliest moment of the game, even if it's not the most ridiculous. It's all just way too much, and too based on conveniences. The thing that saves it is naturally the eyes on me scene, at least that's something at the end of it. There's also the wonder of just who the president is, who we meet very briefly. I'm sure you all have your ideas as to the president's identity, but it's not time to reveal that yet. We also still don't know much about Ultimecia aside from, well, she's evil. An evil sorceress from the future. And this Adele's evil too. Following the bait and switch at the start of this disc, we really need some more info. Maybe Ultimecia was the midwife when Squall's great 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 grandson was born, there's plenty more ways I could dissect this sequence, but in the end you just have to throw your hands up and move on. We'd be here for a long time, and this is the fourth video. Now that we're in the Ragnarok, it's easy to fly around and go to all the places you've been if you so desire, and make no mistake, there's a lot of side stuff that's not getting shown here. There's more action at Shumi, there's a hell of a lot more card related stuff, although truthfully by this stage the rules of the card game had gotten so messed up from playing and abandoning cards in different regions that I just gave up on the exercise. The amount of thought that went into the game is so staggering it's untrue. You can even go back to Balaam Garden, although there is very little reason to. Hell, half of the NPCs there have the same dialogue they had before Squall left with Renault on his back, and it's kind of disappointing that the garden is such a total non-factor in the endgame. We can also check out Esfar City and see what fins are like there following the Lunar Quai. And yeah, it's different. The buildings are still there, but just a little different colour and the atmosphere is now very sombre. 
there are noticeably a lot less people about. A child who is saw at the shopping mall with her mother is now on her own. And there's monsters. Tough monsters. After all of the stuff that I did in Disc 1, this is around about the time that the game finally properly caught up with me, and things I hadn't accounted for started causing me a lot of grief. And so it was time to go to the woodshed, meaning it's time to look at gameplay for the first time in ages. Haha, <laughs> yes, time to perfect those junctions. Actually, it is quite an appropriate time. The thing with the Ragnarok is that you get it very late in the game. Seriously, once we break Renoa out of that memorial, we'll very soon be going to the Lunatic Pandora. I'm sure you could figure that out already, but in any case, the Pandora is basically the point of no return. And no, that point isn't in Disc 4. Once you go there, there's no reason to turn back and ultimately no way to. And so you are meant to fly with the Ragnarok for a while. It's time to get your party ready. Just before that, let's wrap this up. We do go to the Sorceress Memorial, and the scientists who are there don't offer us a lot of resistance. Just as the seal is about to be engaged, Squall breaks it, and Renoa falls out of the chamber. It's another powerful moment as finally, Squall and Renoa get their big hug. This is pretty much the scene that you see on the front cover of the game, by the way. As we leave, Esfar's finest guards block the way. However, a huge man in official looking clothing walks up. He doesn't say a thing, but his gestures speak volumes. And because of this man, the guards let us past. Finally, we're all together again. Renoa is still worried about being a sorceress, especially seeing as she's with Seat, the group who were created in order to protect the world from sorceresses. That is the point of our existence in the end. Zell makes that clear, and gets a shout from Squall for his trouble. Renoa doesn't feel as though she wants to be around people in case Ultimisha gets a grip on her. Maybe we should go somewhere quiet. Maybe we should go to Adia's house. You don't get much quieter than a continent that's only populated by two people. Anyway, let's not do that quite yet. Let's talk about gameplay. How do you go about making your party good for the endgame? Obviously for most people the answer is going to be use a guide, seriously. There's so many freaking items, so many things it seems like you have to do, so many ways to refine magic, so many combinations that when the enemies actually do start to kick your ass again, it's easy to just throw your hands up and let a guide take care of you. You can get some of the toughest GFs in the game at this time. I went out of my way to pick up Bahamut, who lounges at an abandoned research centre right in the corner of the map. If you want to make sure that your GFs have learnt all the abilities that they need, head to Cactuar Island and fight some Cactuars. You might miss a lot, but you'll gain tons of AP. If you want to power level, then head to the island closest to heaven, where you can fight ridiculously tough enemies so long as you've got a good setup. Weirdly, there is also weapons. You can fight Ultima Weapon after getting Bahamut, which will get you the best GF in the game. However, I didn't. This was never meant to be a full 100% completionist one. Keep in mind that this is my first full one for of the game after all. Ultimately, preparing for the end game was more about having what I absolutely needed. And in the end, that comes to getting the best junctions. Ultimately, this can be figured out through trial and error, and in the main, refinement. You fight two armors in the Plains of Esfar, they drop regen wins which refine into full lives, by far the best junction for your HP, the one that will actually bring your character's health to the maximum range. You need good status effect protection, which at this stage means you need to be protected against Confuse, which is always the absolute worst status effect, so get a hundred of those and stick them on your status defense. As far as other essentials go, you absolutely need Meltdown. It's not a difficult spell to get, but it's brilliant. Meltdown is not only an excellent vitality junction up in your defence, but when cast it takes most enemies' vitality down to 0%, and that's very important against some of the upcoming bosses. And then you'll want to get Aura. I ended up drawing this in a later battle, but casting Aura on a character means that they have a much greater chance of being able to use the limit without having to have their HP really low. Limits are something I've only dabbled with until now, as it goes, but they're very important in the big battles, and once you get the Aura spell going, they're a huge difference maker. It's time to break them down. Squall's Renza Kuken is simple. You time critical hits in a combo using a bar, and there's a chance that he'll do a finishing move at the end. You should recognise the first move of these, the Rough Divide. It's the exact same move that Squall used on Sifa in the opening video, and Sifa's Fireball Slash combo is actually his limit break as well. The deadliest of these is Lionheart, which you only get once you make his ultimate weapon and adds another multi-hit combo to the mix. It's hundreds of thousands of points of damage, enough to kill virtually anything. But surprisingly, Squall's Limit Break is not the most effective in the game on account of Lionheart being a totally random and uncommon trigger. There are more effective ways of dealing death. 
Selfie, our favourite, takes a leaf out of Kate Sif's book. She uses slot-based random magic, casting a spell that doesn't have to be in your inventory a random amount of times. Can be weak, can be devastating. The end, if it comes up, is obviously the best attack of them all. Like Kate Sif's Game Over, it's an insta-victory against literally any opponent in the game that's not undead or a multi-form boss. However, it is staggeringly rare. Quistis uses Blue Magic, a set of unique spells that she learns through picking up certain items from monsters. Basically, this is FF8's version of enemy skill. Some of the spells are useless, but there's some special ones. The Mighty Guard is arguably the best defensive spell in the game, Micro Missiles is a free nasty gravity attack, and then there's her ultimate blue magic, Shockwave Pulsar. The Pulsar is interesting as it's the only attack available to us that can actually break the damage cap in one hit. Unfortunately, it's a bloody annoying grind to actually get, and again, there are better ways of doing damage. On the whole, Selfie and Quistis have the weakest limit breaks of the main party by far. This leaves us three characters with better limit breaks than Squall. And yeah, Irvine's one of them. Irvine's break is simply to take his gun and use special ammo to blast the shit out of enemies. You control the amount of shots by tapping R1 for each of them. If you're using quick ammo and you've got Irvine at max strength, this is guaranteed to deal six figure damage, especially against a meltdown opponent. The only disadvantage is that you're limited to 100 shots in each battle because you can only carry 100 rounds of any ammo, or indeed any item, at once. Then there's Renoa. At first her limit break involves abilities that you train her dog to use by reading up on them in magazines and then setting them to be learnt as you walk around. The Angelo Cannon wants a special mention seeing as Renoa literally puts Angelo on her pinwheel and fires him at the enemy. It's awesome. But after becoming a sorceress, Renoa has the absolutely terrific Angel Win. Using this puts her in a berserk state where she casts offensive magic that's five times more powerful than it would be normally at no cost to her supply. The damage is so powerful that even gravity based spells that normally take off half of an enemy's health can kill. However, what you should do is put a single meteor spell on her, get rid of all the trash spells she might have, and you're okay to keep any stronger ones like Ultima for junctioning as the limits bias towards weak spells, and then she'll use meteor constantly. Seeing as Meteor hits a group of enemies 10 times whenever it's cast, a fast Renoa with high magic and a meltdown opponent can deal close to 100,000 HP of damage each time, guaranteed until either the enemy dies or she does. Devastating. But the kin of the limit breaks? Well, that's Zell. Zell uses the duel. In this state you input fighting game style commands for a big old combo. You learn these commands out of Combat Kin magazines, but you can actually enter them at any time so long as you know the command. However, the highest damage attacks and longest combo strings do not concern us. What concerns us is the Armageddon Fist. Basically, you just spam Zell's two most basic combo attacks, Punch Rush and Booyah, to hell and back for the whole of the dual period. Punch Rush Booyah, Punch Rush Booyah. With a max strength Zell and a meltdown opponent? It's not pretty. The damage can get close to 700,000 HP for a single duel. The Armageddon Fist can one-shot the single strongest enemy in the game. That guard back in D-District Prison learnt it, and you should learn it too. Do not fuck with Zell. By the way, the three flashback characters have limit breaks too. Special mention to Laguna for Desperado, where he hooks a rope up to some unseen plane or whatever, and maniacally fires shots at all opponents. But I love wards, especially as it's just an extension of his main attack, which is chucking a massive fucking spear at his opponent. Ward is a fat mute dragoon, and he's great. Limit breaks are pretty great too. It's interesting though that all the dudes have physical limits, and all the women have magical ones, usually with a heavy random factor to boot. There's obviously lots more you can do. You can level up to 100 and use bonus abilities to actually get a meaningful stat increase with each level, good if you're power levelling. You can grind out 300 ultimas, all that stuff, but really? This is the important stuff that managed to get me through the rest of the game. Getting the really good junctions, and making sure those limit breaks are popping. Also making sure Squall and Selfie have their ultimate weapons. Selfie's is definitely important as it gives her 255% hit accuracy, same as Squall. There's a reason why she's always been in the party, it's not just her personality. Winoa, being a sorceress, will handle the magical needs. And with that, we're basically all set. Okay, next storyline destination, Adir's house. On talking with the matron first, we find out something we should have probably figured already. Adir isn't a sorceress anymore. As a matter of fact, she hasn't been one for a while. Her powers passed on to Winoa back at Galbadia Garden. 
Afterwards, Renault and Squall have a pretty important chat overlooking a field, the big one where Renault states her worries that Ultimisha will possess her again, and when that happens, Squall will have to kill her. This time though, Squall stops it and says that no matter what happens, he'll be there. Basically, he says the same words that appear in the intro video, and states that he will be his knight. The whole knight concept is further played on by Adir, that the knight doesn't merely exist to protect the sorceress, but they also help to keep a sorceress in touch with reality. If a sorceress doesn't have a knight, then they can lose touch and go bad, as Adele and Ultimisha have. It's all part of one of the big themes of the game, that you can't do everything on your own and that you need to trust others. Anyway, this is our last proper interaction with Adir. For now, we have to go elsewhere. Back to Esfar where the President has requested our presence. Who do you think that is? Sure enough, once we get there, we run into Kiros and Ward in official clothing, and a long haired dude in less formal wear. Finally, Squall meets with the Esfar President, Laguna Loire. As ever, Laguna kind of failed upwards into power through plans that are crazy on the surface, but always seem to work out. Sorceress Adele could not have been beaten by normal means. Instead, Laguna lured her into the memorial through a loan and pushed her into the chamber. He was elected president in the fallout and has been working hard since then. It seems like there's a lot of things he didn't know until recently, when Alone finally got back into contact with him. He doesn't talk about Rain's death, which makes me think that he only found that out very recently. Speaking of Alone, she's now at the Pandora. Galbadians finally managed to capture her in the wake of the crash landing. Ultimisha still needs her ability in order to go back to the past fully and achieve her goal of time compression. Anyway, there is a plan to stop Ultimisha, and oh boy it's a doozy. We're going to crash into the Pandora and rescue Alone, and then we're going to defeat Sorceress Adele. After Adele's defeat, her power will only be able to pass on to Renoa. And so, when Ultimisha triggers time compression, we'll be there to go through it and get close to Ultimisha in the future, so that we can defeat her. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's crazy on a level which I cannot hope to justify. Beyond stupid. Nonsensical. The stupidest plot point of the whole game. And yet, I can't hate it, because unlike all the space stuff, it's in character. You can pick apart every single hole in this stupid plan, it's not hard. But the plan is kind of Laguna all over, isn't it? This is the guy who thought that jumping off a cliff would be a good idea. The guy who beat a sorceress by pushing her into a sealed chamber. His plans are completely ridiculous, and always have been. And sure, our party could probably stand to be a bit more agape at the plan which is basically, well you'll just travel through time, how I do not know. But, you know there aren't all that many other ideas. Ultimisha is in the world's future, no matter what. We have to stop her in the present. Yes, this could be too much. Considering everything else in the game though, I don't know, maybe it's appropriate they were just running on a win and a prayer. Laguna doesn't make up detailed logical plans. He thinks up ridiculous ones on the hoof and trusts that everything will work out. There is one final important piece of the whole puzzle by the way, one that isn't outright stated, but if you chat to people, you'll know. It seems as though Rain died in childbirth. Kiros states that Squall looks a lot like his mother, while Ward, through his expression, says that he's glad he doesn't take too much after his father. Laguna himself says that there is so much more to say, but not yet. So yeah, that's the big final revolution of the Squall Laguna arc that Rain and Laguna are Squall's real mother and father, truly making alone his adoptive sister. It perhaps makes sense considering how actually similar they are, gives a reason why Squall wouldn't just splutter to hell at his ridiculous plan, because in the end they're pretty damn close to each other. Anyway, we are now about to enter the point of no return. And yeah, that means it's probably a good place to stop. There's quite a bit more analysis and such to do before we actually finish the game, and way too much plot left to simply go through it in the rest of this video. Five videos it is then, yay! Bye for now! Righto, we're basically at the end game now. When we left we were headed to the lunatic Pandora. It's finally time to wrap this up. This is the last proper part. Before that, there is a couple of little things that I want to analyse. First up, I've said it before, but holy hell is this game divisive. I knew that going in, but Jesus, this is the most divisive game I have ever reviewed. Final Fantasy games always inspire discussion, but even the slightest mention of FF8 will spawn pages of it filled with those who love the game and those who utterly hate it. I've seen it myself. 
not just in the first part's comments, but in threads that have spawned from it on places like NeoGAF. You don't often see the game in the middle of people's Final Fantasy lists, it's either at or near the top, or down at the bottom. My own opinion of the game is kind of complex, so I'm saving it, but I do understand both sides. If you embrace the love story side of the game, and if you gel with Squall as a character, you may well fall in love with it. As I said before, I have also seen lots of people who love how open FF8's gameplay system is, and how things are available to you so easily. But that's also a valid criticism, in that the reason for it is because the game is so broken, and the junction system just doesn't work. And it's hard to ignore the flights of fancy that the game takes, that it comes up with these completely illogical things and then tries to justify it with time compression, as if that makes sense. Sometimes people's criticisms do get a bit skew if, like when people say that Squall doesn't have any kind of arc as a character when his arc is probably bigger than most any other FF protagonist, but still there are some strong negatives against the game. Even still though, I'm not sure if all that justifies FF8 being such an emotional topic. There is something weird about this game, something that just pulls you into writing shit tons about it, maybe because it's so different from every Final Fantasy game that came before or since. For my part, I came into FF8 expecting to do a single video, and look at where we're at now. These differences will become even clearer as we do reach the ending, but it's hard to sum up even now. The ways that the game tries to integrate gameplay with story, the relationship between Cypher and Squall as a reversal and distortion of the traditional protagonist and antagonist, the makeup of our group and how they're all so purposefully similar to each other, important pieces of the story's puzzle being hidden away, and the usage of realistically proportioned characters in order to mainly tell the story through animations and gestures. These are all things that Final Fantasy VIII tried to do very differently compared to anything they'd done before. Not also forgetting the fact that this is so very much a young adult story aimed at a specific market, in a way that, again, I don't think any other Final Fantasy had been before or since. Even if not all of that works, it's certainly an interesting journey for those reasons alone. Right, well, on we go then, to the Pandora. We crash into its barrier and with the help of Ragnarok's guns, open a hole up that we can squeeze through. Selfie's at the controls and <laughs> she's having the time of her life. Seriously, this is the best moment ever for her. We make it through and touch down on the obelisk, where straight away we meet up with Fujin and Raijin. It seems that they're still defending Cypher, even if it's out of nothing but friendship and loyalty, and it's now time to make good on the promise we made in Balaam. As with the first Fujin and Raijin battle, this one can be a problem if you're not prepared sufficiently, However we are, so they fall, and once again, they make the tactical decision to retreat. Just as we enter the Pandora, we run into another duo, Biggs and Wedge. They're not happy, although this time it's not because they've seen us, and in fact our presence barely registers. They're more annoyed at the grunt work that they have to do in this big monolith filled with monsters. In fact, they're so annoyed that they say fuck it, and decide to go off and have a drink. This scene is quite symbolic actually, it's the end of the G-Army in our story, and basically the end of Galbadia's involvement. The G-Army have been replaced by monsters from the Lunar Cry inside the Pandora, and they've had enough. We fought our last G-Soldier the first time we tried to get into the Pandora. This should clue you in on something. Even though Galbadia managed to get the Pandora here and help set off the Lunar Cry, they haven't actually directed anything for a long time. And now, as far as Galbadia itself goes, there's only Cypher left, and possibly Fujin and Raijin too. This isn't a triumphant moment, it's a last stand, and part of the reason for coming here is to finish them off. The Pandora is an odd little dungeon. Most of it is optional, and the only reason to go around it much at all is if you did a lot of the optional stuff that was around in Laguna's second flashback, when the Crystal Pillar was being excavated. If you did, then there is some good treasure around. If you didn't, well, sod it, just move on with the plot. The main interest in Finn, though, is the monsters. They're all piss easy and die in one hit, with barely any experience gained. The justification is that these monsters are all totally new, and that it's basically their first battle, therefore they're absolutely no match for us. You wonder why this doesn't apply to the monsters outside that touch down after the Lunar Crime, mind you. I guess you could say that those ones could have got busy cutting down Estar's soldiers and the like, but it's a stretch. Something like that though is where you have to balance between the story and the gameplay considerations. 
Our next big fight is with the robot who dumped Zell and company out of the lunatic Pandora last time around. This is pretty much Fujin and Raijin's last roll of the dice. This time, when we actually face the Finn, yeah, it tends to blow up kinda quickly. Shame we didn't just engage it in combat the first time around, quite frankly. I mean, we were all junctioned, we could've destroyed the bloody Finn. And then, at last, we come into contact with Cypher. Fujin and Raijin are here too, and they're holding alone. Cypher commands his friends to fight us once again and... They decide to let alone go, and she promptly runs back to Ragnarok. At last, they've truly had enough. Fujin drops her usual speech and talks to Cypher normally, in order to convince him that it's over, and to stop the act. Because they're his friends, they want to help him. It's quite a strong scene, and a great development for these two side characters. Fujin and Raijin are a fairly underrated portion of the game, to be honest. One look at Cypher should also tell you something about his own mental state. His once splendid white coat is now tattered and torn. There's truly nothing else behind him now, well, aside from his fascination with Ultimisha. In the end, Pride, along with Control, won't let him stop. He dismisses his friends, although not without a salute, and we have to fight him for the last time. The final Cypher fight starts with a pretty outrageous moment so long as you have Odin, the summoning of Zantetsuken. Everything plays out as it often does, with Odin ready to cut Cypher in half, but then, Cypher's blade cuts him in half. Odin's steel cutting sword flies up and into the hand of an unseen individual. This sets up Cypher pretty damn well for one final awesome encounter which, well you don't get if you're prepared, Cypher himself is still just kind of weak honestly. The best thing about him is that you draw aura from him, and that's what I spent the battle doing, until the unnamed figure from earlier is suddenly summoned, at which point he knocks Cypher for six. If you know Final Fantasy, then you know that this is Gilgamesh. It is in fact the same Gilgamesh from Final Fantasy V where he was an antagonist. After being caught in the interdimensional rift at the end of said game, he ends up here after coming through a portal. Gilgamesh is a recurring character in Final Fantasy, but this was his first proper appearance in the series since the fifth game. This appearance is kind of a cool easter egg. Now that Odin is gone, and he is gone, Gilgamesh takes his role. He appears randomly in battles to help you out with one of four attacks, including Zantetsuken. He can also deal big damage with Masamune, another common FF sword, and Excalibur. If you're unlucky, he'll use Excalipur, a cheap knockoff of the latter sword which deals a single point of damage to all enemies. And of course, if you never actually got Odin in the game, you don't get any of this at all, and you just fight Cypher normally. And so it appears that Cypher is finally done. Renoa is a little conflicted about this and kind of walks away. But he's not done. In fact, he springs back up and, sensing the opportunity, captures Renoa off screen. At which point Zell comes in, seemingly all the way from the Ragnarok, to tell us just that, even though she walked off screen seconds ago. A bit silly, but whatever. Disc 3 ends just as Cypher is about to shove Renoa into the arms of the waiting Adele, but we're still right in the middle of everything, so there's no time to stop. The presence of another sorceress to possess wakes Adele, stroke Ultimisha up, and she embraces Renoa. Meaning, of course, that we finally have to fight Adele. It's a fairly gruesome sight. This can be a tricky battle again because you're on a time limit. Adele drains health from Renoa, and if she dies, then the game is over. You also have to be careful not to actually hit Renoa, so no spells that damage everyone. In fact, you absolutely should not do what I did here, which was to stick Aura on Squall and use Renza Kuken. I was lucky in that this Renzo didn't have a finishing blow. If it had, well, I'd have probably killed Renoa. As it is, it just killed Adele instead. With Renoa freed from Adele's grasp, Alone sends her back in time so that Ultimisha can cast the Time Compression spell before quickly bringing her back. At least, that's what I think happens. The plot is so crazy right now that truthfully I'm not too sure. In any case, the Time Compression begins, a long FMV sequence. At the end of it, we have this weird fight where basically we go against several different generic sorceresses through many ages and surroundings. It's not a difficult fight, it's just kind of long. I suppose that through doing this, we are kind of fulfilling the role of Seed and the goal of Ultimisha. Seed were made to combat aggressive sorceresses, and we're doing that. Ultimisha also wishes to be the one single all-powerful sorceress, and after time compression is over, she now is. At last the spell is completed, and the party find themselves in the future, just outside Ultimisha's castle, the final dungeon. Phew. 
Well, I don't really know what to say about the plot goings on. Again, it does kind of make me understand why people get so annoyed with the game. It really does get a bit too much with all the time compression stuff, the alone bit, Renoa suddenly getting captured again. How many times is that now? There's some great FMVs and set pieces, of that there is no doubt, but the plot that hands them all together does become quite weak. And Artemisia is, well, we're going to be fighting her, aren't we? Short of seeing her personality when she was controlling a deer, there's so little that we know. Is she just a throwback to the final bosses in older Final Fantasy games, the really big monsters that we didn't know a lot about who were the cause of other goings on, as opposed to being more like the Kefkas and Sephiroths? Was Cypher the true primary antagonist this whole time? Hmm, there's more ponderings, and there's that other theory too, we'll get to it. Just before we head off to that final dungeon, I'd like to talk a little about the game's music. While generally it's of the same high quality of most Nobuo Uematsu soundtracks, it's still quite different in a way. There's less emphasis on individual character themes, more on big unifying melodies that you often hear repeated throughout the game. It's constructed differently from other Final Fantasies in that regard, although there are some notable themes that repeat for characters, such as Laguna's Man with the Machine Gun or Inoa's My Mind. The soundtrack isn't as typically catchy as a lot of the FF soundtracks, but it's definitely moody and no less of a soundtrack for that. And the cornerstones of the series, such as dungeon themes, battle themes and boss themes are really freaking great all of the time. And yet it's still kind of an underrated soundtrack by some. Maybe due to the couple of missteps there are? Not many people tend to like the world map theme, or the SFAR theme. Still it's strong work regardless, and as we get to the end of the game, I thought it deserved something of a mention. So here we are then, Ultimisha's castle. Now we can go outside if we wish, there are some portals that take us back to the world map. You can also find Ragnarok again. You have to go to a chocobo forest in the central continent, find a chocobo so you can get over shallow water, and then you can get the ship back. Mind you, the world is a wholly different place now. Oh, by the way, if this is the first time you've caught a chocobo, you're treated to an explanation of something called Chocobo World, which might confuse you. This was a mini-game that you could play on something called a pocket station with your save. It was kind of like Sony's answer to the Dreamcast's VMU. You walk the chocobo around, fight enemies, and you can gain unique items and even a GF or two for the main game by using it. However, the Pocket Station was never released outside of Japan. Chances are most folk have never played it, although it is available on the Steam Edition that I'm playing. Anyway, right now you can barely go anywhere. All the towns are naturally locked off due to time compression, because, well, it'd be rather silly if you could quickly stop at Timber for a bit and talk to someone about the resistance against Galbadia who hasn't had their speech updated since, like, Disc 1. Balaam Garden, well, isn't even on the map. There is someone on the Ragnarok who can sell you supplies if you need them, and you can still use the plane to get around if you feel like you need to level more or get more spells and so forth, and you can still obtain Odin, Bahamut and Eden from their locations if you haven't already. Other than that, this is the end of the game. The world is empty. There is nothing but the last dungeon. I've complained a lot about the quality of the dungeons throughout the game, that most of them seem to be rather lazy cut and paste efforts, the sewers, D District Prison, Galbadia Garden and so on. Either that or there's only a few screens in them, the lunatic Pandora in the end is a good example of that. I can see what happened now, all of the big effort into making dungeons went into Ultimisha's castle. Considering that most of the last disc is this dungeon, yeah it's worth it. A truly fantastic, huge dungeon that's filled with stuff to do. The main gimmick of the castle is that while in there, most of your commands are sealed off. You literally only start with attack. There are seven bosses inside the castle, and you can unlock one command for each one you beat. Hell, it's possible to go straight through everything and head to Ultimisha's master room if you want and trigger the final battle. Although chances are you would lose. Also, you split into two parties and use these weird points to switch between them. This is only actually used in one of the dungeon's puzzles, but it is also helpful if you want to quickly switch to the second party, who start just inside the entrance, and get out of the castle if you want to save. As far as unlocking commands go, well it depends. Items are good to have, as is magic, you definitely want ways of healing yourself available as quickly as possible. If there's any GFs that you missed, you can also draw them from the bosses in the castle. It kinda depends on how you play. There was one hairy moment, 
I faced one boss with my second weaker party, who I wasn't able to heal after putting the junctions on them, with only attacks and limits at my disposal, and the boss had high defence against physical attacks. Fortunately, Quistus's micro-missiles and Irvine's shot got me through. Just about. <laughs> it was pretty hairy. As you get more commands, the bosses become fairly easy seeing as you use the same strategy against all of them. You start with Meltdown, and then bash them with physical attacks, perhaps using Aura for limit breaks against some. And there is also a special puzzle that summons Omega Weapon, the single strongest enemy in the game. Whether you do that or not, it's a damn good dungeon, where you kick back and just enjoy the excellent graphics, surroundings, and music. Finally though, after going up a spiral staircase and traversing a long bridge, you reach the Master Room, ideally with all the commands unlocked. Will we get the big evil speech that we've all been waiting for, now that we're finally facing Ultimisha? Of course we have already had some, we did have all that she spouted when she was in control of a deer after all. She certainly knows us, calling us locusts that swarm across generations, which, to be fair, we kind of did do when we were going through this compression. Eventually though, she does keep things short. It's time for the big fight, and if the final dungeon itself was pretty damn good, the final boss fight itself, <laughs> that's even better. The fight starts as follows. The first form is simply herself, and she casts high level magic against three party members she picks at random. If and when a party member is knocked out, they will be absorbed into time if not revived after a turn, and another member will replace them. The battle only ends once all members are defeated. In the end, you will very likely be left with your three actual good fighters, the ones you've junctioned. As it is, Squall started with Zell and Christus by his side for the first form. Zell and Christus had nothing on them, so they died quickly, which brought Irvine and Selfie into play. And hey, this at least meant I could start doing proper damage. Irvine died just before the first form finished, alas. So long, cowboy. After a bit of a beating, Ultimisha decides to cash out of the battle temporarily and bring in a new force, Griever. You may know that name already. Back in the Battle of the Gardens, Rinoa returned Squall's Rin that Zell had borrowed. That said Rin had a sort of image of a lion on it, and you could actually give it a name. Griever is Squall's ultimate idea of a GF that Ultimisha creates from that Rin in order to fight the party now. It is also possible that you gave Squall's win a silly name when asked to, which might cheapen the dramatic power the scene can have. Griever's attacks are mainly physical, but he also has the powerful Shockwave Pulsar at his disposal. You may well want to heal after that one. After beating on Griever a little bit, Ultimisha decides to go into second form and junction herself with Griever, creating this quite repulsive looking beast. It wouldn't be a final battle without all of these stages after all. Ulti Griever means business. She can summon monsters, cast Ultima, use very nasty physicals. It's best to get rid of her quick. In storyline, getting rid of her means overcoming Griever, this manifestation that was born out of Squall's mind, essentially overcoming his own issues in the final battle. There's no better cure for that than Renza Kuken. But of course, it isn't over. Once Ulti Griever is done, we get the true form of Ultimisha right in the middle of time compression. A creepy theme is introduced, which then suddenly kicks into a remix of the classic Final Fantasy boss theme, possibly the best music in the whole game. This is the toughest battle of the lot for various reasons. She can cast Hell's Judgment on the party, which reduces everybody's HP to 1. She can also entirely deplete your stocks of magic, even if they're junctioned, which can have a very nasty effect on your characters. Suddenly, a really powerful character is a weakling. She also has a spell called Apocalypse, and if you haven't healed properly after Hell's Judgement, yeah, that's game over. Once her lower half is revealed, you can actually draw Apocalypse from her and cast it if you wish, it will hurt her. After a lot of healing and battering, as well as Renoa getting knocked out, Ultimisha starts a final speech. It's actually a fairly sombre statement. In full, she says, Reflect on your childhood, your sensation, your words, your emotions. Time, it will not wait no matter how hard you hold on. It escapes you, and... She only starts saying this once her HP's gone, but she says it in segments and you have to keep attacking, especially because she herself can still attack during this time, even if she does at this point seemingly accept her fate. The speech is never finished, and is the last bit, and with one last attack, Ultimisha is defeated, thus ending one of the greatest final boss battles in the whole of the Final Fantasy series. Seriously, this entire final dungeon yeah, the best gameplay was definitely saved until last. 
Although Ultimisha is defeated, our characters are stuck in the void with seemingly no way of escaping. They can only cling on to the one idea that Laguna had, that if you think of a place where you want to be, then that's where you'll eventually end up. It seems that the majority of our characters do find a way, except for Squall, he's still struggling against himself. We get a long look at this internal fight, in particular as he tries to remember Renoa. The scene where Squall first met Renoa is constantly replayed, but distorted each time, with Squall unable to remember anything clearly. There's plenty of images in this montage, some of them quite shocking. I mean, you've probably all seen that one image of Squall with a big hole where his face is supposed to be, haven't you? Squall is trying to get to where he needs to go, but is still finding nothing but grey bleakness. For Renoa, the white is replaced by the field, and a feather is something that both Renoa and Squall can cling on to. She sees him in the field, but Squall doesn't hear her, and in the end there is still one more place Squall needs to go, as time compression falters. We go back to the orphanage, years ago, with a young Squall and a matronly Adir, who stumbles upon Ultimisha, or what's left of her. She is thoroughly beaten, but she cannot die, not until she passes her powers on. And so she does, to Adir. Afterwards, Adir runs into the adult Squall, who tells her that she must form Seed. The end of the story is the beginning of this story. It seems that Ultimisha's plan to become the all-powerful sorceress and ruler of time was always fated to end this way, and will always end this way. In creating her plan in order to get revenge on those who wronged sorceresses in the past, she sealed her own fate. Back in the field, finally, with Squall appearing close to death, the feather brings him back. Time, it seems, has been restored to where it was. As we move into the ending sequence properly, you get to see how various people's storylines finish. Cypher is now free of his sorceress fascination, and is having fun fishing with Fujin and Raijin as Balam Garden passes over his head. It's a great symbolic shot in which he's become the fallen angel, basically. Laguna remembers when he proposed to Rain as he pays a visit to her grave with a loan, and in the end, well, the folks at the garden have a bit of a party with everyone dorking off as usual, and Renoa outside with Squall, who we do not see until the very end. Mind you, it's possible that he could have just been the one holding the camera. Everything's all fine, at least for now. Ultimisha is still in the future, but we know how the story ends. And that's how this story ends. Roll the credits. So, final thoughts? Final Fantasy VIII is undoubtedly a very interesting game. There's nothing all that much like it, either in the history of the series itself or in JRPGs generally. It's been a long ride and, yeah, there are flaws in how ridiculous the storyline gets and sometimes how everything seems to be hung together by strands of spittle. But for all those issues, I would be lying if I said that I didn't enjoy like 90% of my time spent with Final Fantasy VIII, and if I said that I didn't grow to love the journey and warm to its characters. Most of them anyway. I highly recommend playing Final Fantasy VIII if you haven't, not necessarily because you'll think it's a brilliant game, as more than any other game I've ever reviewed, there is a definite your mileage may vary sticker on it. This is a game you either love or hate. But as a manual for storytelling, and in particular combining story, characters and gameplay, it's filled with so many ideas. A lot of them are rough, but they're novel. Many of them would not be taken up by Square. After this and FF7, not to mention the proto-industrial FF6, Final Fantasy IX, which was developed at the same time as FF8, was presented and seen as something a lot closer to the series' roots. Final Fantasy X, the first PS2 entry into the series that started development as FF8 was released, would do its own thing. As such, there's lots of things about FF8 that represent a road not taken in design, making it a unique entry in the series that should be experienced and can be appreciated no matter how much experience you have with Final Fantasy or JRPGs as a whole. Square tried to create a game that would appeal to everyone, from the most dedicated RPG fan to the casual. In many ways, it's like a JRPG sandbox where you can use junctions to build any character into exactly what you want them to be, and you can pretty much start doing it from the get-go. It's not exactly the most stable system, put mildly, but some people love that experimental side of the game. Either way, it's hardly a game that you can just be nyeh about. Personally, it's certainly not something I regret. It hooked me in pretty quickly, annoyed me at times, but ultimately, yeah, I kinda loved it. But, well, we're still not done. What about that ending and what it really means? 
And what about those two theories that always come up when people talk about the game? Squall is dead, Rino is Ultimisha. I've waited until the game itself was finished to talk about them, otherwise I'd have had to talk about them in stages which would just be annoying, especially when the ending itself is such an integral part to both theories. So yeah, let's break them down. Right, Squall is dead first. This is a fan theory that seemed to develop in the mid noughties from forums and what have you, but ended up gathering a fair bit of steam. In short, the theory posits that Squall died when Adia stuck an icicle through his chest, and the rest of this game is his pre-death dream. Personally, I'm not a big fan of this theory and I don't really buy it, but it's worth going through its main points. The whole thing is available to read at squallisdead.com. The first point is, of course, what happens to Squall's big wound. After Squall realises it has healed, it's not mentioned for the rest of the game. People assume that Adir healed Squall so he could be interrogated, although that doesn't hold because Squall is a new member of Seed and thus could not reasonably be expected to know much. Maybe though, Adir healed him due to a matron tendency that could still be there? Not to mention that it wouldn't have been the right time for him to die. I do understand the theory, it comes from the usual routine that every death or knockout in battle is non-canon, but any death in cutscene is, something that Iris obviously demonstrated in the last game. But did Squall actually die there? One other thing worth noting is that it's not the only time that we see Adir's ice spikes. The ice strike is actually her limit break, you can use it when you play as Adir. It does a fair bit of damage, but it's not an insta-kill attack or anything. So was it there? There's certainly doubt about that. Another point to the theory is that there's lots of weird fins all over the place once you get into disc 2. Moombas, Shumis, floating gardens… how can this be real? Surely it's all a dream. I don't like this part because it seems like trying to apply real life logic to a JRPG, which you just can't do. What about all the monsters running about before Squall takes the icicle to the chest? Those are acceptable, but Moombas aren't? Come on now, you just can't be consistent with that. It's not like FF doesn't have a history with friendly people who aren't necessarily human either. There's also the fact that fate becomes a constant theme in the game, especially after disc 1. Yeah, perhaps, but that doesn't necessarily equal dead protagonist. Sure it's said that Squall is fated to be the leader of Seed even though he's just a cadet, but as explained there's literally no other choice. To be honest, I think Sid's just buffing Squall up there. Being fated to fight Cypher and Adir is also explained too really, even if GFs and other greater forces are a big part of that. Then there's the establishment of Cypher and Rinoa in Disc 1 as the actual relationship, thus making Squall and Rinoa, which doesn't really get going until Disc 2, the dream relationship with a touch of the vanilla sky about it, whereas Rinoa and Cypher doesn't get that much of an airing after Disc 1, at least if you ignore when it does at the end of Disc 2, which the theory does. It also relies on characters never changing from the moment they're introduced, which they clearly do. We know that Reno and Cypher had a flynn, and that's how she became aware of Seed, and Reno speaks of possibly being in love in the aftermath of Cypher's death, which is a perfectly natural reaction to loss by the way. It doesn't mean that the love is actually genuine. Quistis even goes into this at the orphanage in fact, thinking that something's love when it actually isn't. There's just not enough there to make that relationship concrete, honestly. Now the ending is naturally where the theory is strongest, the whole sequence where Squall's lost in the abyss and a lot of different memories flash back, everything from Cypher to Deelin to Reno at the party who constantly appears in distorted images. This could be interpreted as Squall losing touch with his memories finally as he reaches the end of his dream, and then in the end Renoa finally finds Squall and he appears to be dead until the feathers fly up. We don't even get a proper sight of Squall at all until the final shot of the whole game, with Reno and Squall out on the balcony. There's no denying that Squall being dead is one way to interpret this whole thing, especially with some of the shots that appear, or indeed a lot of the other FMV shots seemingly centering around the events of Disc 1. Mm, perhaps. Still there is a general problem that I have with the theory as a whole in that I don't think it particularly improves the story at all. Doesn't oh it was all a dream just seem kind of unsatisfying? That's the sort of ending that usually comes in for massive criticism when it's employed, and rightly so. Frankly the whole thing being a dream, if that was the intention, makes the story feel like a bit of a waste of time and kind of cheapens the whole experience. I guess that's why I just don't jive with Squall is dead all that much. I feel like if that was the case and Square had made it obvious, then people would care for FFA a hell of a lot less than they already do. On to the second one then, Rinoa is Ultimisha. 
This theory posits that Renoa, being a sorceress, is destined to become Ultimisha in the future as all of the friends she has die, she loses her knight, and loses her grasp on reality. She becomes angry at the way sorceresses are treated, and takes her revenge. Now this theory to me is a bit more interesting. Some say that Square have openly said that the theory isn't correct, although I can never find exact proof of that. It's said in FF8's book that sorceresses have a lifespan as long as a normal person, but also that a sorceress cannot die until they have passed their powers on to someone else. So that still seems a trifle open-ended. Square have also paid a bit more lip service to the theory in one of the Dissidia games, where Ultimisha's weapons share Renoa's weapons' names. It's an older theory than Squall is Dead, first coming up sometime in 2001. The theory is mainly based around foreshadowings, a deer saying that Squall must fight to the end even if it will bring tragedy in others, or Renoa saying that it's okay if she ends up being killed by Squall and only by Squall while dealing with her newfound sorceress abilities. There are also certain similarities between Renoa and Ultimisha. Winds play quite a big part in both of their designs, they have similar facial structures and so on. And one of the big points is the summoning of Griever in the final fight, a guardian force that Ultimisha creates from Squall's Rin, and one that Renoa knows about too. Indeed, she's the only other person who knows about Griever because she wanted a Rin just like it. Is it significant also that Ultimisha, in her sorceress form, has lion's feet? Renoa is Ultimisha certainly gives the end in a different sort of twist. If it's true that Renoa is fated to become Ultimisha, then the end of the game is actually quite downcast, especially for a Final Fantasy game. Most of the time FF games like to wrap things up on a more positive note, rather than saying that ultimately, once Squall is dead and all of these other people are, Renoa will live on and ultimately cause this particular world crisis, which Squall and company will resolve in the future by killing her. But then, Final Fantasy VIII does do a lot of things differently to other games in the series. It also certainly helps with the weakest part of Ultimisha, her complete lack of character development, and it does rather work thematically with the game's themes about fate. Maybe this connection is what Square were going for with Ultimisha's final, sombre lines that are so at odds with how her character behaves through the rest of the game. It's not often that Final Fantasy's antagonists get that sort of final speech. Hmm. I quite like the theory. I think if it were the case, it would definitely add an extra layer to the game. But do I believe it? Eh, uh, not sure. There's not really any kind of smoking gun to be found, either here or with Squall is dead. And a theory is, in the end, just a theory. A lot of the evidence is open to different interpretations, and some of it could just be coincidental. Either way, they're fun to speculate on, and they can be fun to argue about, so long as no one gets too hectic about it. But then this is Final Fantasy VIII we're talking about, so obviously they do. And with that, well... That about wraps it up. I'm not sure if there's all that much more I can say. Except, of course, to thank you for joining me on this rather epic five-part journey. It's certainly been one hell of a ride, and even if FF8 isn't a game that I have as much experience with as I do with FF7, hopefully I was able to do right by it. Bye for now. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this video, then please do like it. You can also subscribe to the channel, check me on my Facebook or my Twitter, or indeed my Patreon if you'd like to see things like Google Hangouts or Skype chats or review requests and all that good shit. Now, for this video, I would like to thank the following Adam Schaefer, Andrew Dalton, Andy Cat, Audie Sawley, Conformist, Dustin Cooper, Gary Pinkett, George Newton, Graf and Blackpool, Guy Middleton, Ian Roberts, James Id, James Loveridge, Jason Goy, Jason Leach, Jason Stevens, Johan Eriksson, John Scott, Keith Barlow, Kyle F, L. O'Brien, Lee Norris, ManagerSim.net, Mark Heslop, Mark Johnston, Mark Whittington, Martin Pataki, Nanette McCrone, Olaf Allbeam, Pete Morris, Peter Sidorn, Filter Prog, Potter Margell, Rachel Maxwell, Romeo, Ryan Wyatt Coleman, Sean Zoltek, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Taylor Armand, The Unnatural, Tanya Jay, Twisted Squote, Vishar D, and Yurka Operator.